Welcome. Today is Thursday, December 15th, 2016, um, of the Arlington School Committee. Um, we, before we get with our regular program, um, Dr. Buddy wants to make an announcement about tomorrow uh, school, as it's very cold out. She wants to tell us this, the plans. The, the plan right now is that we are going to have school at the regular hours. We've looked very carefully at temperatures. The difference between 7 and 10 is about 4 degrees. Winds do go down, but they don't go down a lot. Um, so parents should plan on having their children in school, and we would encourage parents to be make sure that the children are, if they're going to walk to school or standing at a bus stop, that they are wrapped well. I expect that a lot of parents will drive their child to school, and if that's the case, uh, Please, when you pull up to the school, drop off and leave quickly, because I, I expect to have long lines there tomorrow. But as, as I've said in the past, on days that where there's some issues around snow, this is another example of a situation where parents are going to have to use their own discretion. If you feel that the conditions are unsafe for your child to come to school, then what you need to do is call school, let them know your reason. It will be an excused absence, but it will be an <coughs> absence. And uh, it, it's possible that this could change. I don't think it's going to change, but if it does, as we've done in the past, it'll go out on School Messenger, as well as be available um, on the media and our website. Thank you. Um, are there any public participation? <coughs> no. Okay. Uh, so first, uh, today we're continuing the session of uh, budgetary requests. Um, uh, today is about middle and high school and special education requests. We're going to start with the middle school. Is that? Yes. That's right. Okay. Start with the middle school at Audison. And AEA. And a AEA is doing their yeah, their thing. Doing uh, thing. Yes. Sorry. At, at the <coughs> end. Yes. Thanks. Excuse me. Great. The Audison community appreciates and thanks the uh, school committee, Superintendent Bodie. Can you just it's introduce yourself? I know we know. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Um, good evening. I'm Eileen Woods, um, the interim principal at the Audison. Great, thanks. Uh, the Audison community appreciates and thanks the school committee, Superintendent Bodie and Assistant Superintendent uh, Chesson for supporting the important work of educating our Audison middle school students. In addition, we'd like to thank the Arlington community for the continued support through the Arlington Education Foundation and the Audison Parent Advisory Council. This academic year, the 1,215 Audison students and faculty have benefited great, greatly from the additional staffing to address the needs created by enrollment growth. And I highlight five key areas two additional eighth grade cluster teachers who have enabled us to maintain a smaller class size, which ensures that teachers can give individual feedback, differentiate curriculum, and build supportive com classroom communities. An additional 0.6 physical education teacher, which has lowered class size, ensured locker room safety, and met required planning time for the PE staff. The point two family and consumer science teacher helped balance the core sections with other exploratory departments. The need for an additional full-time nurse has helped meet the needs of daily visits from over 60 to 90 students. The additional needed class sections due to increased enrollment <coughs> in exploratory classes have helped students to be more successful learners. So we thank you for those. This year's budget requests are framed with input from Audison teachers, administrators, leadership team, and department chairs. Our key levels are quality teaching, academic rigor, and individualized student learning. As a, tradi uh, as a transitional leader uh, at Audison this year, 
The work has been centered on looking at supportive culture norms, structures, models, and systems in place for teaching and learning at Audison. We are fortunate to have at Audison a talent, talented teachers who have strived to do an outstanding job in a school that is at maximum student capacity with space limitations. Quality teaching means investing in and developing educators to provide students with powerful teaching and learning, along with support staff that prepares them for college, career, and citizenship. Academic rigor is achieved by implementing consistent standards aligned with curriculum, supported by high quality instructional resources. An individualized, personalized student learning means ensuring that each student receives targeted, data-informed instruction with appropriate social and emotional supports. We do realize this is a challenging budget year and we are mindful of looking at our resources in a different way, but wish to frame minimal needs for the 2017-2018 academic year for artisan learners. As you know, this is a very special, very critical period of a student's life, and our students endure more changes that they will for the rest of their lives. They are changing physically, sexually, mentally, and socially, emotionally in every way. Their minds change from childlike to adult, not so much in what they think, but how they think. There are more important changes taking place at this age than in any other time except for their first year of life. And so this gives us an op a unique opportunity to support them with this development. With these unique needs in mind, the highest budget priority for Audison is aligned to the system goal of social-emotional learning. We are requesting a 1.5 adjustment counselor social worker. This increase will help to support the needs of students in regular education, special ed, ELL learners, and students on 504s. With both the adjustment counselor known as guidance and the social worker, we are looking at developing a structure that helps our students who are increasingly affected by many social forces impacting their role as students. We look to be proactive in developing intervention strategies to increase academic success, assist with conflict resolution and anger management, help students develop appropriate <coughs> social interaction skills, and assist students in understanding their role in the greater community. We hope to continue to provide professional development to staff with essential information to better understand factors such as cultural, societal, economic, family, and health, affecting students' performance and behavior. This additional staff will help us to put in place a more comprehensive collaboration between adjustment counselors, social workers, grade level cluster teachers, special educators, ELL educators, and support staff. We are also requesting funding for professional development that will help with achieving the district and school's emotional, social emotional goal. This year, we had five educators attend the responsive classroom six through eight workshop to look at middle school practices. At the middle school level, these consist of responsive advisory meetings, investing students in rules, brain breaks, small group learning, active teaching, student practice, problem solving, and structured reflection. We need to examine middle school responsive classroom strategies and others such as Mind Up, Strong Kids, and Second Step to determine the best practices that accomplish this goal for our learners. Audison teachers are eager to take on professional development opportunities. We want to support teaching assistants with more training and to look at how they support our learners in special education, ELL, regular ed programs, and students on 504s by looking at the schedule, the structure, and models that are presently in place. We look to establish a committee of special educators, ELL educators, and regular ed to look at programs 
students' needs, schedules, and placement for the academic year 2017-2018. Teaching assistants allow Audison teachers to provide increased opportunities to learn, more time to spend with students and on academic tasks, and increased, increased ability to assess learning and provide meaningful feedback. Teaching assistants are the lifeline to classrooms and assist insisting teachers. The classroom is a dynamic place, constantly changing based on the complexity of students and the multifaceted components of the curriculum. Developing problem solving and thinking skills in <coughs> students takes time for teachers to collaborate with students to bring out and enhance the ability at deep levels. The main focus of curriculum initiatives is individualization and differentiation. Teachers work hard to understand each student's level to enrich and to review a practice. They need to be able to provide time for students to engage in quality lessons and get in-depth feedback on their assignments. As a result of differentiation and individualization come developing varied groupings which teaching assistants can support. In these small groups, in-depth understanding is developed through experimentation, discussion, and project-based learning. All these groups need physical space in an inclusion classroom. Class size also impact, impacts teachers in how they engage student participation in each of these activities. The present eighth grade class is 22 students, while in the sixth grade it's 24 to 25, moving upward, which will be the case uh, with the incoming sixth graders given the increase of about 40 more students to the present enrollment. Teaching assistance helps support all students, particularly in large class sizes. Middle school is an important time for students to explore their interests. Our exploratory classes offer avenues to do this. The additional FTEs for next year as we look at minimal increases are the following, 1.2 in world language, 0.2 Latin uh, increase. There are 66 students enrolled in the sixth grade Latin class. It is highly likely that most of these, uh, most or all of these students will continue with Latin next year into seventh grade. We are currently running two sections of seventh grade Latin. If we keep two sections, next year, the class average will be high. 0.4 French and 0.6 Spanish. French enrollment in the French program at the middle school has doubled with no staff to offset the class size increase. Our eighth grade French class average is 27, and our sixth grade Spanish class average is 25, and our eighth grade Spanish class is 25. So we anticipate continued high levels of enrollment in both languages. The point four in visual arts is centered on enrollment growth to support the work in art, especially the digital lab for eighth graders. The point two DML, digital media learning, computer science, to expand the offering beyond sixth grade. The 1.0 reading teacher is to support students needing specialized reading instruction and students who are on individual educational plans. I want to highlight support and support the resources needed for Audison. The Latin textbooks, digital subscriptions, um, the current middle school Latin books are in very poor condition. So we propose purchasing a class set with online textbook access. The visual art supplies, while enrollment has grown, funding, funding for expandable art supplies has remained static and the department has added a digital component component to the curriculum. We are requesting an increase for expandable art materials. We request new science textbooks and digital subscriptions for grade six, full implementation. The music department would like 10 more risers and three keyboard pianos. In closing, I just want to say that it is an exciting time of change for the Audison Middle School coming up, and I know that with change brings great opportunity. As we begin to discuss the possibilities for teaching and learning at the sixth grade Gibbs, and we can 
and we continue to discuss how to best support and engage the staff and the students at the future 7th and 8th grade artisan as well. In both schools, building a link to each other through leadership collaboration, shared best practices, curriculum alignment, open communication, and teacher capacity will only benefit all middle school learners in the years ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, questions and comments? Yes, Mr. Hainer. Uh, will we be able to, is it the time now to ask questions about that chart, or are we going to wait for that? Uh, the chart is basically representing the requests. For all of them. So so I, for all of them. Do you want to hold off until after we have all the presentations? <clears throat> I say right now we focus on questions about Audison. Mm -hmm. I, have a, mm -hmm. I have a general question. I'll wait. It, <laughs> okay. it deals with the whole thing. Okay. I'll wait. Okay. Questions? Yes, Mr. Slipman. Okay, uh, as you know, we're about to uh, divide your school a, a year forward. Uh, what is your thinking in terms of budget and setting up the school for the uh, fis for fiscal eighteen? Uh, for for the, the, what we're budgeting for in anticipation of the split in fiscal nineteen? Have you thought about? any sort of structures in place and how to, uh, are there any budgetary things we need to be doing this year in order to anticipate the, the following year's split? Well, my sense is that some of the things that are being requested this year mm -hmm. will probably not be funded. Mm -hmm. uh, so if in fact that is the case, then they would go on my, to the uh, physical, it would be fiscal 19, I guess, right? Because we're going into we're, we're 18. Planning for 18. Yeah. I, the, so it'll be, it would be yeah. fiscal 19. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I mean, I think those are uh, discussions that as you bring your, uh, an audit mm -hmm. group of, of teachers and mm -hmm. administrators together, that they would be looking at the needs as repurposing mm -hmm. audit in terms of the space mm -hmm. and how it, how it's going to function. That would be my sense. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the, this, the whole committee recognizes the fact that next year, because of the number of students you're going to have in the building, is going to be a challenge, because the building was built for 950, 1,000, and uh, then the, you, you can have a second challenge during the subsequent year of splitting them right. uh, into, into two groups. And uh, yeah, I just want to make sure that anything we can do in the planning process at this point that will help to facilitate uh, the opening of the Gibbs is, is at the top of our list. And so I think that that's an opportunity mm -hmm. for the present Audison mm -hmm. to also be working simultaneously as a committee comes together with Gibbs. <coughs> have a committee coming together for the audison to be really looking at, mm -hmm. you know, how it's going to be repurposed, what are the needs, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of, um, you know, instructional resources mm -hmm. that would be needed uh, in that academic year. Yeah. yeah. Mr. Rothers, did you want to speak to this issue? Did you want to speak to this issue? Is this? Okay. Yeah. Come up to the microphone. Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, in, in addressing your question, mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Schlick, Dr. Schlickman, um, I specifically thought about that with respect to my request for the sixth grade curriculum materials, mm -hmm. thinking that uh, as, the, as the sixth grade teachers move to the new building, they're going to be um, quite distracted with all the new things, of mm -hmm. setting up things, mm -hmm. and that it would be much better for them to get familiarized with a new curriculum mm -hmm. while they're in their old familiar habitat mm -hmm. and then be ready to move and ready to roll with that mm -hmm. so that they could then focus on some of the other issues. Yeah. So that this, it, my, my request for the science curriculum materials was specifically directed at trying to beat that move. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. So. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. But I didn't, uh, I, I set up a poor precedent, haven't I? <laughs> How many people want to speak to this issue? <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Mr. Collins, yeah, come up. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> hey, um, thank you. Sorry. Yes. This, 
the 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 request for the point two in DML, which is the computer science, mm -hmm. is in reference to this also. So what I'm trying to do is, if sixth grade, which is the current grade that has DML, moves to Gibbs, in terms of transitioning, I wanted to use next year to start to establish something in both uh, either seventh or eighth mm -hmm. that allows when we do split that we can actually have programs in both schools that have a year to establish. Mm -hmm. So the point to ask is for that elective that will allow us to use next year as the place to develop it mm -hmm. to prepare for that transition. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks. Okay, uh, additional questions, comments? Ralph Sampe, you look. <laughs> this is the question I don't wanna ask. Um, I can tell from how you phrased everything in here that you're aware of our budget issues. Yeah. Um, for those listening at home who didn't tune in last week, um, unfortunately, our revenues look about equal to our needs just with the regular budget mm -hmm. next year, and we don't have much money at all over and above to fund <coughs> all of the needs. And so now I'm going to ask, is there any ranking of things that you could give us or any, because the bottom line is this year, we're going to have to choose, pick and choose among what we can fund, what we can't fund, what we hope to fund in the future. Um, as I said last, year, last week, it's really helpful to us that you're putting down all the needs because mm -hmm. this is going to help us with budgets going further into the future. Mm -hmm. But for this year, it's unclear how many of these needs we'll be able to fund. Mm -hmm. And it would be helpful to us to hear from you which are higher priorities, which are lesser priorities, um, and if not, then we'll have to make our, I mean, with, in conjunction with the superintendent and everyone, we'll have to make our best judgment. Um, so so the, the highest priority would be the um, adjustment counselor. That would be the highest priority because I think the social emotional piece for our learners is really a high priority. So, uh, and uh, as I said, knowing that the budget, uh, this is, you know, uh, challenging you know, with the budget that it, I think it's important to educate people around that there are more needs and that the with the understanding that some of those may not be funded until the following uh, academic year. Could you speak to why it's a 1.5 position that you're asking for? Well the 0.5 social worker w was really to support um, students on uh, under regular ed uh, and um, there's a number of students under regular ed on 504s, and even students in the classroom that can be supported with social, emotional, mental health needs. So, okay. so is um, adjustment counselor dis different than a guidance counselor? Or no, I, I call it adjustment counselor, but I, th the same. I think it, you know, it's known as guidance, so. Got it, okay. Yeah, trying to. Okay, got it. Yeah. Uh, so, Mr. Carton, I, I um, told us that he would be late and he's just walked in. I also want to acknowledge uh, Julianne Keyes from AEA um, is here as well. Uh, other questions, comments about Audison? Yes, Mr. Uh, thank you for the presentation. <clears throat> Kathy, we're definitely going to be hiring a, uh, a, a principal for the Gibbs for next year. So whoever. We're going to be hiring a principal for Gibbs <coughs> this year. This year. It's going to be an internal search. And it'll start in the fall of mm -hmm. 17, she or he will? Well, be, be part of the planning process. A lot of planning will occur during the summer. I think we'll get some committees started during the school year. But generally speaking, when we do serious curriculum work or planning, it's often summer work because that's when um, there's more uh, concentrated amount of time. So I would like that person to be part of that planning. The person, that's why it's internal, because if you hired a principal for Gibbs right now, Gibbs doesn't yeah, really right. exist. Um, and there's interest, too, I might so, add. But it'll be an FY18? It would be an FY18 position, yes. That person will be, f the, the title will be Gibbs principal? Yes. They won't be teaching or doing something else? No. Okay. Oh, right. oh, they wouldn't be <coughs> teaching? No, I mean, they wouldn't be doing something else? It would be a full-time position as Gibbs principal? 
Expressway. In 1718, no. Yeah, that's what I think. Or it won't so, be in 1718. Yeah. In 1718, no. no. It will not be. No. Okay, in so that's 18, not a middle 19, school. 1819 okay. when it opens. Yeah. Okay, 1819. But at 1718, the, the individual will be doing something else. Yes. Okay, then they'll be, they'll be freed up a little bit, some of their, their time to prepare for the Gibbs. Correct. All right. And so, <clears throat> so next year, you're asking for 1.5 FTEs, social, emotional counselors, and then mm -hmm. in the curriculum area, 1.2 in world languages, 0.4 visual arts, 0.2 DMO, 1.0 reading teacher. Mm -hmm. Do I got that right? Mm -hmm. You got that right. I got it right. Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. <laughs> good Thanks for working yeah. me through it. Yeah. Okay, so <clears throat> I want to understand uh, if we don't make the um, world language hires, the visual art hires, the DML hire, uh, in particular, what is what does what does that do that to our our to those classes for next year. They'll be high. The so like what, what, is, what high. does high mean? Does it mean? High, high in the high, tw uh, yeah, like 29. Yeah. Moving upward, yeah. Yeah, 29 plus, plus. in those yeah. classes. If we don't make the hires. If we do make the hires, it goes back down to 22 or so or 21. Yeah, it goes back. It, 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 does, it does go back down, yeah. 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 So I mean, and, and this is not a, so the social emotional hire is, is, is a higher priority for you, Dr. Woods, than this position? It is, yeah, it is. Because I think it affords us to really look at the structure. Okay. And, um, and how you wrap services around the classroom okay. and support teachers. So you wouldn't want, okay, all right. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> the uh, reading teacher, you listed that as a priority too, and, and can you just talk about you know why you think that's a priority what are the needs in the school that is a priority um, to give specialized reading instruction to students uh, who are on individual educational plans so it's really supporting their plans um, and also um, uh, students who who need reading support uh, and specialized instruction is there some is it, you know, different programming? Yeah. Is there some data to support? Sorry, is there data to support? I mean, is there a higher number of students that are not at grade level in the in the Addison? Yeah, there are there are students who who need reading support, and they you know they wouldn't be um, yeah, they wouldn't be um, they you know they I want to say they're. yeah they're not at grade level. Yeah, right? they're not at grade yeah. level because it would be yeah. good to know I mean, it would be because it, you know I don't want to speak about individual students but no, we've no, done an to, analysis yeah. of all the students who really need yeah. reading support yeah because if this is a priority it'd be good to, it'd be good to know the data so if there's there's like x number of students that are right, at a grade is. level yeah and we yeah. know who needs that support yeah yeah i think miss keys wants and to that's becoming something. more and more on um yeah. students coming up yeah, yeah. Uh, just remember speaking to the microphone think, sorry i don't think it. the percentage or the number of the number of students has gone up but the percentage of students who need reading support hasn't gone up okay we just have more kids yeah and we haven't had more teachers, so there's not time in the day to schedule more kids into reading. Right. Okay. I don't think the percentage of kids who needs reading support has increased. But the it's number, just more people. More kids, so the number's right. gone up. Right. That would be helpful data to have. So, you know, several years ago, X number of students mm -hmm. needed reading support. Okay. And now, uh, next year, we anticipate that this number of students will be need, need reading support. That would be very helpful data to understand. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, Mr. Hainer, so just don't want, go yet. I just want to clarify one thing. You mentioned the reading person. Is that reading person or persons necessary for both people on IEPs and not IEPs? Yes. Because I just want to make the distinction. We're required, but budget cannot dictate whether we can or we cannot support right. the IEP. Right. So that part is a fixed number. So mm -hmm. if that's needed, it's going to happen. That's right. I just want to make that clear for everybody. Okay. Thank you. Actually, I just have one question. Uh, the thing, one thing that struck me is your request for additional training for teaching assistants. And so right. that wasn't, uh, and I was wondering, I know that we don't pay our teaching assistants very much. Do you see additional training as being an attractive thing that we could offer? You know, we can't pay you very much, but we, we're giving you some training to help you with your next steps. Yeah, but, I do. I do okay. because, they, because of the programs that they're supporting. Mm -hmm. And I also think that it's important when they go into the classroom that they know exactly what is expected in terms of um, what they're expected to do. So be beyond just point, you know um, hiring them, I think there's a piece that we need to 
continue to do is to support them. Got it. Yeah. I do think it would be attractive. It would make us because they're, you know, they. I mean, I, they're, I, they're 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 worth much much more than they yes. receive. I mean, as as everybody in this room knows, we yeah. do not pay people as much as they're worth. Right, right. And so, <laughs> we have to find other ways to show them that we value them. Right. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And we do value them very much. I I like to refer to them as the lifeline of the school because they're supporting in many many different ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank yeah. you. Um, I, I think that's it. Is there anyone else? Okay, great. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, so it's the um, special ed. Yes. Um, okay. Oh, did you want? Oh. oh I thought you said they were going. Yeah, I thought you said. You said no, I think going. they're going at the I end, right? Going at the, at the end. end. Yeah. No, we were scheduled. They're, okay. they're scheduled at the end. Yes. I was trying. As you can see this evening, we have a number of our curriculum leaders and um, our special education coordinators, and, and maybe this might be a good time to introduce, um, you know, the special education team. Yeah, yeah. So I was actually that was going to lead gonna with that. That um, hi, I'm Allison Elmer. I'm the special ed director, and tonight we have with us. I'm going to turn around, but still look at speak into the microphone. We have Chris Carlson, our out of district coordinator. Lynn Bennett, our high school um, special education coordinator. Stephanie Greiner, the middle school coordinator. Elizabeth Logue, an elementary coordinator. Joyce Schlanger, who's our um, early childhood coordinator. And Craig Haas, who is also an elementary coordinator. So good evening, Dr. Seuss and school committee members. Um, we'd like to thank you for this opportunity and hope to use this time to briefly highlight our priorities for the upcoming school year and answer any questions you may have about the areas of identified need. Um, Again, similar to everyone else, we'd like to begin by thanking you for your support of our previous uh, request. While we were unable to realize the full request, we do understand the challenges faced last year and again this year in meeting the many needs across the district and within our department. And we recognize that the out-of-district tuitions have become the main driver for this year's budget proposal. And for this reason, we have limited our request to positions we believe will have a direct impact on um, reducing those costs. Uh, as uh, people have mentioned, and we continue to talk about, the enrollment growth does have an impact on our department as well. Um, while similarly, our percentage of students receiving special ed services has been consistent, the percentage of a greater number is a larger number. So um, you can see in the figures we provided how um, we have been growing steadily. Um, Last year, we did request 4.0 FTEs for learning specialists at the elementary level. Um, we were able to fund two of those, so uh, this year we are asking to remain to fund the remaining 2.0 positions. Uh, and that's based on our analysis of student placement data in our in-district programs at the elementary level. Um, if you look at the figures we provided, um, you can see that there has been um, consistent, relatively consistent growth, especially over the last three years in the referrals to our in-district programming. Um, and you can see where our current enrollment is in each program in the third figure we provided. Um, I think it's important to note that the Stratton program has three classrooms, uh, the Dallin program has two classrooms, and the Brackett program has two classrooms. So you're looking at sub-separate programming that can go up to 12 students. Um, per teacher, however, we have space limitations. We also know that too. So um, adding another classroom isn't an option in some of these buildings either. Um, so we really believe to kind of stem the tide of referrals, we really need to put the supports into the home school where students can be served in the least restrictive environment. Um, and we're requesting that we get the additional 2.0 uh, learning specialists so that the uh, Stratton and Bishop School will also have three learning specialists. Um, we do currently have three learning specialists at Brackett, um, Hardy, Dallin, and Thompson. Um, and at those schools, we've been able to do some of these things that we think will really have an impact on uh, student uh, needs. We have more greater co-teaching models. You know, when you work at two grades versus three, 
in some cases four, um, you know, you, you can have that connection with the teachers. You can have the time for the planning. The elementary principals talked about last week that need for a schedule to allow for common planning time. Well, part of common planning time also allows for special educators to service students through the inclusion model. If you have three kids or, you know, three classrooms at fifth grade that have, you know, special ed uh, services, but they're all having math at, you know, the same time or different times, mm -hmm. one educator can't support all those students in that setting. Um, so we've also been able to do more R RTI or response to intervention, um, which keeps kids ultimately out of special ed, ideally, at the schools where we have um, more learning specialists because they are part of that intervention team as well. Um, the other request that we have, I hear, believe you will hear echoed at both the district level and specifically at the high school, but it speaks to Dr. Wood's request. Our second request is to create an administrative position to oversee the implementation of the so many social emotional learning initiatives um, we have across the district as well as oversee the supervision and evaluation of guidance counselors and school social workers. Whatever that title for that person be, whether it be guidance director, director of social emotional learning, that be up. But What's important in that role, we believe, is that we know, again, that the, um, you've heard this echoed by the AEA, by the elementary principals, by Dr. Woods, I'm sure you'll hear it from Dr. Janger, that the social emotional needs of our students are not only, you know, becoming more complex, but we're seeing more students with them. Um, and we looked at our data for the out of district uh, placements and over the last three years, um, we've had 58 new placements, um, students that have gone out of district, and 31 of those were to address social emotional needs. Um, 26 of those 31 were at the middle and high school level. Um, so we really believe that this position is important to help coordinate the efforts across the district. We did recently receive a Safe and Supportive Schools grant, which will lead to the implementation of Safe and Supportive Schools teams at each building. Um, but we really feel like we need somebody to help drive that work, to facilitate, organize that work, and to you know allow for consistency pre-K to eight. Mm -hmm. So those are our two requests for this evening. Um, we thank you for your time and consideration. And if you have any questions, we're happy to answer them. Yes, questions, comments, Mr. Hainer. I'm just looking on that chart where it says expansion of SLB, SLCB <laughs> summit program. It says one for 73,000, two for 25,000. Are Those, they two different types, two different positions? Um, I actually am looking to Dr. Bodie and Dr. Chess, and I believe what you're seeing is what the request that expansion. were unfunded la last right. year. Right, right, mm -hmm. and it says expansion. I'm just looking at this, they look like the same things. But one, one, I think uh, Dr. Asin Ampe can One actually. says teachers and one says teacher assistants, teaching assistants. Thank you. Looking. Didn't look to the left. I looked to the right. Okay. Thank you. Wait, I, I think, are you, are you done? Okay, would, Mr. Cardin. Uh, thank you. So <clears throat> we've gone from having, as recently as five years ago, just one learning specialist mm -hmm. from the elementary schools to three, which is a great improvement. But I wonder uh, if with only 270 students at Pierce, if it's really justified to have, I, I understand that the coverage is much easier when a learning specialist only has to cover two grades. but. With 270 students, is is the, is the caseload there really? Can can you really justify having three <coughs> learning specialists there? We're not requesting three for Pierce. We're requesting one for Stratton and one for Bishop. Oh, okay, great, thank you. Okay. Uh, yes, Mr. Thun. So it's a three FTE increase. The two learning. Do I have that right or no? No. I, I, are you looking at the budget worksheet that was No, I'm looking at the narrative. You? We're requesting 2.0 <laughs> FTE for learning specialists at the elementary. Plus To the increase less. the current um, staffing at the building from two to three. Okay. All right. That okay. helps. Thank you. And then <clears throat> the second request of the administrative position. Yes. And who, so who's do overseeing all of this? Is that you are doing that now, Allison? Somewhat. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, you know, I'm doing my best to support the efforts across the district. Okay. And so, it's, you know, the super, the director of guidance is a stipended position shared mm -hmm. between a number of people um, right now, um, taking, I think, pieces of that, um, you know, then Pri there's, go Prior ahead. to, um, uh, Cindy Bouvier uh, mm -hmm. uh, retiring, she reported to me. 
Okay. Mm-hmm. And she did. Cindy did a lot of this stuff. Is it? She did some of it, yeah. In this yeah. paragraph, okay. All right. And so now she's. And gone I think and there's newer it. things that yeah. you know right. we have we've added to people's plates. You know, again, in the effort to build capacity at the school level, ultimately, but it's going to need someone to drive and organize that work. Mm-hmm. I used to be always opposed to like adding administrative positions, then I became an administrator and I thought, <laughs> oh, a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <clears throat> yeah, Dr. Ray. Well, to that point, I mean, it is a good point to ask, is this a brand new position? Right. It is and it isn't. Um, that the job that was actually done by Cindy Bouvier, who was a director, so we've never really filled that position. Um, tiny pieces of it, she still does, but it's been spread out among other people. And we'll hear more about that too, I think, from uh, Dr. Janger. But it is something that as we do this work, and, and this year, as you know, we have the grant to look at what we're doing, what our coherence is, and some action plans. There really isn't anybody to lead this, you know, in a you know, yep. pulling everybody together K-12. It just isn't. No, I get it. I mean, I, I mm. can't disagree with that. So, so is there a chance that we would, we would save some small amount in stipends by bringing an administrator in? Um, that's one of the things that we took a look at this afternoon. Um, it, it would be some small amount. There are some stipends that we, we could put towards that. Okay, great. Mm-hmm. Thanks. A little bit. I, I know it wouldn't cover the whole thing. I was just curious. Mm-hmm. Um, other questions, comments? Yes, Mr. Cardin. Uh, so the, I'm not sure if you've seen the summary sheet that Diane prepared. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if it was already covered what that, what that is. We've been skirting around it, but we haven't been going into so, it. <laughs> so it does, it does seem to include the requests from last year that were, un, right. that were unfunded, mm-hmm. but your, your summary does not discuss those requests. So are you still requesting those items? Um, I think, you know, as um, you know, Dr. Allison Ampey has been, you know, driving home, I, I'm aware that they cannot fund those. So if you're at what would be the true priorities would be those. The new stuff. The okay, new stuff. great. Thank you. Well, they're actually, neither of them are new. new. They are carryovers from last year, but the, yes. the ones that we highlighted tonight. Great, thank you. Um, so Dr. Jane is coming? He is, he's going to be here at, at around 7.30. Okay, so should we continue with? Or the AEA, you want to hear the AEA? We could. We could do, we could could do AEA. <coughs> he's walking right now. Oh, yes? Oh. Right now. Okay, great. Okay. Um, thank you. You might, I don't know if AEA or Ms. Tugalecki, who is here for um, athletics, wants okay. to talk about. Did you want to do that? Sure, why don't we, why don't we go for the left athletics? Great. Um, thank you all um, for the opportunity for us to you know, share with you how the athletic department's doing under the umbrella of the high school um, and come to you with our requests. Um, just to update you, Our athletics programs have continued to grow um, on and off the field. They've been doing really well, um, qualifying for nationals, uh, state finalists, league champions, and off the field, uh, they received leadership and sportsmanship awards, which has been a huge initiative of ours and expanding it to an educational athletics program. Just today, we are notified by the state association that um, Arlington was chosen to have three seats on the student ambassador board, uh, which is the uh, small group of about 20 student athletes that represents the state of Massachusetts. Um, so Arlington will now serve as ambassadors and other schools. Um, so we're really proud of our uh, student athletes for that. Um, this year we're coming due with gratitude for the support last year um, and with the same ask as last year. So last year with our ask, we were asking for 906, uh, 965, and we were able to get partial funding for that. Uh, we're still facing the same demands um, and growth challenges uh, as we were last year. And so what we're looking for is to close that gap of having uh, previously underfunded programs coupled with now growing programs. Um, And when you look and and analyze the reason for that increase, it primarily comes down to fixed costs, um, which are rise in cost of transportation, um, facility cost, and rentals. Um, We have improved maintenance Investments, which you know we think better protects them. Um, we have longer seasons from success, and we have more athletes participating. 
Um, and we also implemented a full-time athletic trainer to support the growing needs for safety training, um, CPR certification, um, and on-site assistance. Um, so, like I said, the support from last year has been huge in making um, growth and progress towards being where we need to be to run our, our, our current programming. Um, but due to the fixed costs that I just mentioned, which comprise a majority of our overall spending, um, you know, we're, we're looking to meet that final ask uh, figure. And what happens is that the things that end up being cut and impacted when uh, so many of our costs are fixed are things that are really felt by the students and, and the coaches. Um, so it's, you know, it's equipment, it might be cutting back on, on games and trying to figure out bus rides and really asking them to pull back where they can, um, which everyone has been doing a wonderful job of. Um, but, you know, currently we do run at a lower budget than our competitive uh, schools who field the same number of student athletes and programs. Um, and, you know, thanks to our coaches and athletes, they have parallel experiences, even without you know the parallel resources. Um, so you know we, we do greatly appreciate their efforts. And the last thing uh, we do just want to note is that you know what what we're trying to field there is an educational athletic programming uh, research supports that through educational athletics in partnership with an education uh, communication skills are improved teamwork is improved confidence is improved social emotional issues are down. Dropouts are down, graduation rates are up, disciplinary issues um, are down. So, you know, for all those reasons and just the history in the, um, of this great community, here, what we're coming to you for. Okay. So, thank you. Uh, questions, comments? Mr. Cardin. Uh, thank you. So, there have been an increase in the athletic budget, but the fee revenue has not really <coughs> seemed to have gone up that much. So, it more being funded out of the regular <coughs> budget which we want to be supportive of, but if we do have data about, or if you can get some data about what levels are in other towns that you mentioned, um, certainly yeah. that would be helpful in, in us being able to support um, the level of funding or even increased funding. Yeah, and, and we do actually, we've, um, I've worked closely with the business office um, to, to do all of that and to look at all the different ways that uh, we can manage our budget most efficiently. Um, and be mindful with our resources. Um, so we do have those figures of other communities. And we have to look a little bit deeper at them in terms of some don't have to pay for ice time, which comprises one of our major costs. Um, some might have different transportation expenses, which is huge for us. Um, so I have those details as well, uh, which can provide a deeper insight than just the figure. Great. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Absolutely. Great. Yeah, so if you can send, send things along, that would be great. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Questions, comments? Okay. All right. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Jenger, high school. <coughs> Sorry, I was giving just in time. We were just, we were a couple of minutes before. <laughs> Never happened. Ready for you, so I know, I know. So I wasn't sure whether folks had a handout version Sensibly of, no, but of this. So should yes. I pass this uh, We have an Summer, online have an version. So we're we have electronic an electronic version. version. Yep. Yeah, we, we got that in time. Five pager, yep. So if anybody wants copies, I brought copies. Otherwise, okay. Thanks. I'll take them downstairs and use them for scrap. <coughs> um, so thank you for having us up here again to discuss this. I usually take this as an opportunity to just talk a little bit about what's going on at the high school. Um, I know that at this point, our budget situation is dire, so we really try to keep to sort of the major issues that we want to talk about. So I think every year it's important to kind of give an overview. Right now, we're roughly 1,300 students at the high school. It goes up and down on a daily basis. In this, I noted it was 1,303 because that was the last consistent number. And the really important thing to realize is that that number has been growing pretty consistently over the time I've been here. Over the last three years, we've gone up by about 80 students. We expect to go up by 80 students between this year and next year. So as you can see, that rate is accelerating. And depending on whose estimates you look at and what kind of an attrition rate you think we're going to get, we expect to continue to go up at that rate and be near 1,500 students in the next three years. Um, and so when you take into account the overall condition of the school, which, as we recall, is 400,000 square feet, we use about half of it. Um, it's in relatively poor repair. That's why we've put into the MSBA and are currently in the middle of the new building project. Um, I always remember the number that when I came here, which was that we did an audit of the facility and found 
that to repair or replace everything that was broken or past its usable life would be $40 million to start out with. <laughs> um, and as you can imagine, we haven't put much of that money in over the last three years, so I imagine the situation has not gotten any better. Um, that is all as sort of a ground rule, sort of a, a basis to put in context the fact that in spite of that over the last three, four years, Arlington's performance has continued to be high and has actually improved. We are still a gold medal school on U.S. News World Report. Newsweek calls us one of their top schools. We're a top STEM school. Washington Post calls us one of the most challenging schools in America. I'm not sure how they calculate that, um, <laughs> but they do it. Um, and every time I say those things, it's important to sort of just realize how well we're doing with such a difficult situation. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really important to give the teachers in particular and the rest of the community a huge amount of credit for being able to kind of squeeze that kind of value out of the mm -hmm. staffing issues that we've got, the facilities issues we've got, and to still give that sort of result. Um, and it's also important though, anytime you do well on any of these rankings to note that the rankings are just that. They're based on certain measures that are easily observable and they don't really capture the reality of a school. One of the things that's really most value about Arlington High School is really our emphasis on all kids, not just the ones that necessarily do well on the test scores, but all students, making sure that all students are successful and really trying to educate the whole child. So jumping ahead, having put that all in context, um, I suspect you don't want to go on for too long. So the simple version of this, the back of the envelope, is this. If we're going up by 80 students and those students are all taking seven classes, you would need, I did the number, make sure I get it right. What did I say? I said. 5.6. Yeah, I said 5.6, <laughs> and there it is. We would need 5.6 teachers just to staff that with an average class size of 20 students. So. We've made this same request every year for the last three years. And every year for the last three years, we've gotten about half of what we've asked for at best. So that continual not keeping pace continues to put pressure on us in a number of ways. Um, the simple version, which we use just as a way of having a somewhat consistent measure, is looking at large class sizes, but that doesn't really capture it all. If you look at our <coughs> science class sizes, those are 31% of those classes are 25 and over, as you see. History 26, math 21, English 20, world language 20. But one of the things that doesn't capture is our efforts to support students who are more challenged. The way we achieve those class sizes in the first place is by piling more and more teach students, I'm sorry, more and more students into the classes with more independent and more easily managed students. At the same time, we also have class sizes at the, at the other end for IEP classes and classes that in curriculum B that we try to keep smaller. Those class sizes, in order to keep some of these numbers down, have also crept up. So when we're looking at these class sizes at the top end, we're not necessarily capturing that. So there's a bigger effect that goes across for everybody. It's also important to notice that our elective classes are at their caps. We cap things like facts, um, woodshop, computer science because we have a limited number of stations that students can work at. When those students can't get into their electives, they're not taking classes. They have fewer opportunities available to them. They have less flexibility available to them. And so this continues to be an issue. Um, the trends that I describe here, rising enrollment growth, Chapter 222 requiring us to support students outside of school, um, higher levels of social emotional need among students, which continues to grow every year that I'm here. And this is not an Arlington phenomena. It's a national phenomena. It's not something we're doing to our kids. Or if it is, it's something we're all doing to our kids. Um, the, the need to stay level one requiring us constantly to close the gaps, which become vanishingly small, um, and the evaluation requirements, all those pressures are not going away. As our staff creeps up all, and our number of students creeps up, all of those continue. Um, and so. What's interesting about all of this is so we've listed here what we think our staffing needs would be to sort of keep basic enrollment and to fill basic classes. In spite of that, and in spite of recognizing how little we have, when we ask our staff, when we ask the administration um, where they would put their effort, they have said consistently, and why I'm going to say it now, that we would start with a dean. And to be honest, part of the reason why we start with the dean is because when you have those social-emotional struggles, 
when you have the larger class sizes, one more section of English teacher makes a big difference to kids, but it doesn't service everybody. And those pressures and sort of keeping everything running smoothly are something that people are looking really importantly for. Um, I'm not specifically asking, I will say that we also do support the request, which I think has been made by pretty much everyone who's come in here, that we really do need to coordinate social emotional learning across the, the district. So depending on how that's done as a guidance director, or director of social emotional learning, I know that's a larger conversation. But <coughs> coordinating those services across the different district is going to make everything move more smoothly, is going to make it easier for us to manage the numbers of kids that we're still going to have and the needs of kids. So that put aside what we are currently asking for in terms of staffing. And let me put this in context. What we do is we look at every single kid and the numbers of kids in classes and pipelines of kids and we estimate the numbers of kids and the retentions of kids on spreadsheets going back multiple years and looking specifically at kids. So when we're looking at, for example, in math, a point four, we have looked at how many kids are gonna be in Algebra one, um, and how many sections that requires if they're gonna be this many in honors and this many in curriculum A and this many in curriculum B and this many in a small cohort class for special education and realize that we need one more section. If we were simply looking at the overall picture back of the envelope, we'd say 5.6. What we're asking for here as a total is only 4.8 because that's what we see we can do. All those numbers get tracked continuously throughout the year and there are multiple points at which we are adjusting and fine tuning both what staff we have available, what skills we have available, and what specific kids we have. That said, um, so in math we're looking for a point four, in English for point one point oh, social studies one a point six, in science, biology, and physics, and some of this is limited, to be perfectly honest, by lab space and places we can put the students. And then in world language, I promised um, uh, Ms. Ritz that I would point out that it's 1.0 in French Spanish, so a French Spanish teaching position, and a point two Mandarin. And the reason why she's asking for those in particular is because in order to allow, it's particularly in Mandarin, but in all those other programs and in French, we've had growth in those programs. As we have growth in those programs, the students are wanting to move up to higher levels. If we don't have the sections, the students can't move up to higher levels. One of our fears is that that creates a kind of a spiral where if you look forward and realize you're not gonna be able to take the three years of Mandarin or the three years of French because those classes aren't gonna be staffed appropriately, um, you're gonna make different choices. And so in order to keep all of these programs alive, that's what she's looking for. Now I've listed here for um, electives, point four in family and consumer science, point four in visual and visual arts, and a point two for internships. More importantly, as I said, what we're really looking for is a 1.0 to be able to respond to the fact that the kids are going to have to go somewhere. We don't necessarily know until we take their requests exactly where they go. We know that last year we had 80 students who couldn't get into family and consumer science. It's a good bet that we could fill four sections more, but we're asking for two. Mm -hmm. um, we have every expectation to think, given the size of our, of our enrollment in our classes, that we would have growth in that area and we have ways to staff those. That's why we specifically said those. And then I would point to the um, internships and learning beyond school. One of the ways that we're going to enrich our students' experience, and frankly do it in a cost-effective way, is to give students opportunities to learn that don't require us to have a teacher sitting in a classroom. Right now, with a point two, we have about 40 students who are doing internships. We've moved that forward fairly slowly. If we wanted to really push in terms of having more students in their upper grades do internships, capstone projects, work study, and other out of district, um, out of school activities as part of their day, um, we would need some more staff. And we wouldn't buy that, we wouldn't sort of buy the point too if we could do it with existing staff and we would see that based on enrollment. Mm -hmm. But that's a push that we wouldn't be able to undertake if we didn't think, you know, if 150 kids wanted to do internships right now, I couldn't staff it. Um, so we would need to be able to figure out how to do that. Um, so moving on, just to give you an idea of things we're doing, um, you can all wave if you get bored or go on too long. Mm. One of the big focuses in the district I know this year is social emotional learning. Um, I had a big section on that last year. Mm -hmm. I've moved those things down to the bottom and talked about new things we're doing this year. Um, this year we've done a large number of professional development activities around social emotional learning, cultural competency, suicide prevention, gender identity. We have more planned going forward. We just planned today our mental health awareness day, which is hopefully going to have a lot of that sort of activity and training going on for students. Um, this year our transition program, which if folks are aware, 
for students returning from long-term um, hospitalizations or absences, we had a program called the Transition Program. The idea was students would come in, they'd get support, they'd be able to transition back into their classes. The challenge was that we have many students with chronic or complex health issues who don't transition back to their classrooms. They need that ongoing level of support in general education. They don't necessarily need specialized instruction through special ed. What they just need is a place where they can keep up when they're not able to go. If a student has a medical issue and they have to take a period out, but they don't know which period it's going to be and they need someone to get their work for them and support them, you need that on an ongoing basis. So we divided that program into what we call harbor and shortstop. Harbor being a program with expectations, limits, and goals that supports those students going forward, and shortstop being a place that students do the traditional transition as we used to talk about it. Um, another initiative we've done this year, which is a, an outgrowth of our two-year efforts to look at student climate and student culture, is the AHS Voices United. Um, we had 11 teachers trained over the summer to run trainings with students. We've run two of them now. Um, we're hoping to run trainings where 30 students a month um, we'll have a full day training looking at how do you address issues of bullying, harassment, bias, and degrading language. Mm -hmm. um, the trainers f sort of first focus on empathy, then they focus on understanding the differences in relation between intent and impact, and then they look at the ways in which <coughs> students can intervene to change the culture. One of the things we realize when we've done focus groups and talks to students is um, they find Arlington to be an inclusive and welcoming school. Mm -hmm. They find that they have positive relationships. They find that they trust the school and they like coming here. Nonetheless, mm -hmm. um, there is a continuous and unfortunate level of very unpleasant, very damaging discourse that goes on amongst our kids. It's not just our kids. It's not only within our school, but on social media and elsewhere. The difference between intent and impact, which kids understand if you ask them, you say, what is the intent of students who say these things? They say they want to get a laugh. You say, what's the impact? I couldn't go to school for a day. Um, the difference between intent and impact is important, and having students understand that and work to make that behavior go away is something we don't see. We don't see it as teachers. We can set a goal, we can talk to kids, we can connect to kids. We're doing that sort of relationship building through advisory and other activities. But we can't be the one who says, as I said to the kids, that's not cool, and just shuts it down. Um, and so we've been working with groups of students on that. We've had 60 students do that. We have follow-up meetings. We had about 40 of the initial 50 or 60 come to a pizza lunch, and it was great. We asked them, what have you done differently since you've been there? And I kind of figured they'd say, well, not much. But they were all really inspired in terms of saying, I'm reaching out to other kids. I'm trying to get my friends involved. I go sit with other kids at school. I go through the day differently. Um, we have, so we have more of those going forward. So that's pretty exciting. And the advisory program continues to grow. We're getting better at it. Usually it really takes about three, four years before we weed out the bad activities and the teachers know how to do the good activities well. Um, and they sort of believe that it's going to be a success. And I, again, it is something that I think we need to really credit the teachers. Going into an activity used to be a 50-minute duty where you could grade papers, take attendance, and kind of keep them quiet. We've now made a duty be that for 25 minutes you have to engage with a group of students. That's energy consuming in a really mm -hmm. busy day. Mm -hmm. It's 25, 20 more kids who are in your head as somebody you're responsible for and worried about. And then um, last but not least, sort of a lot of work has been done on digital technology. This year we launched our BYOD initiative. Um, and it's really remarkable, I mean, I, and I really appreciate the support we've gotten from the school committee, the capital committee, and AEF, who has made an awful lot of this possible. With that support, we've trained teachers, we've gotten more and more facilities throughout the building, we've been able to pilot um, teachers having connected classrooms. And so in, it's only been three years that our teachers have had a reliable MacBook and a reliable projector in their classroom. And at this point, Google Apps for Education as a platform has been adopted very strongly throughout the school. Almost every teacher has at least a presence on Google Apps. Um, and one of the things that I take as a diagnostic, I hadn't shared this with Laura, um, was we've finally gotten computers into Old Hall. And that's only happened in the last week. And the kids, all of a sudden, they're not leaving Old Hall anymore. <laughs> because there's so much connected instruction going on, that suddenly now becomes a very useful place for kids to go. So all of a sudden, we have 20 seniors who won't leave Old Hall because they get the computers first. The seniors would never stay in Old Hall before. Um, so I'm going to skip over a lot of these other things. You can read it here. 
And then I just do have to make a pitch. I started with the building, which is a bit of a wreck. We need to remember that it's not until 2019 that we're hoping to break ground on a new building. And then that building is going to take, I don't know, two to five years to build, depending on how the architects plan to do it. At the moment, we have 1,300 students in the school. We have 85 roughly teachers and another 20, 30 staff. There's a lot of people right now who come to work and deal with a building that I expect to be freezing cold tomorrow in some sections and boiling hot in others. Um, and it's going to be important that we make a commitment to really s sort of deal with the quality of life of those teachers. Our teachers work extremely hard, they're really committed, and honestly, they're extremely resilient around the things that happen. We just now just joke about the skunk or, um, or the holes in the ceiling. Mm -hmm. But it really is an ongoing issue. Mm -hmm. We have pipes that failed. We lost three or four classrooms just a few weeks ago. They're replacing those pipes and closing the holes in the wall and moving us back into facts and art. Um, all of those things really interfere with people's instructional time. So we know maintenance and facilities are doing their best, but it's very difficult for them when we go to them and say, can you fix this? And they say, with whose money? Um, and we don't have the $10,000 that it's gonna cost. So I think it's important to however it is you budget it, because I don't budget that amount, I didn't ask for it, to realistically budget for unforeseen repairs that have to happen quickly in the high school in order to keep it all running. And apparently you've already spoken about athletics, so I'll stop there. Yes, yeah. yes, thanks. Uh, questions, comments? <laughs> Mr. Slickman. Yeah, I, 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 when I read this, uh, I, I looked at the building as an issue, and I'm not quite sure what the question is or how to approach it, but I do want to make sure that you're able to run <coughs> school in this building uh, for the next three to five years is required until we uh, are able to transition <coughs> to a new facility. Uh, with the move of the custodian, with the building and maintenance over to the town side and the agreements that are happening there, what's happening with the building and what barriers are we encountering or, or you know, it, it, it's being raised as an issue. Is there something we need to do or thing, are we working things out? Uh, where, where do we need to be? Sure. Well, Dr. Betty? Mm -hmm. um, how it works is that the, we do have a, a rental account, mm -hmm. which is the well from which we draw funds for <coughs> unexpected emergencies. Mm -hmm. And for example, at Audison right now, we have, talking about heat, we, we are going to either need to replace three or one, depending on the size of a heater on the roof, because we have no heat in one section of the building. Mm -hmm. That's going to be fifty to 60000 we have a part of the auditorium that needs and, and that needs a heating unit as well. Mm -hmm. So these things happen on a regular basis. It's not just the high school, but mm -hmm. the high school, given its uh, condition, always has something. The facilities department is the group that organizes this. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. one of the things that has happened this fall is the person who's been in charge of maintenance mm -hmm. has left uh, the, the town, mm -hmm. and so there's been a process of trying to fill that position. They've also hired um, and just started two weeks ago. Ruthie Bennett, or is oh, pardon? Ruthie Bennett. No, she's still here. Yes, no, oh. she is. Oh, I'm there's not a her. hierarchy, okay. and, and in fact, I could. What you, I mm -hmm. thought we had shared with you the org chart for mm -hmm. facilities department. I think mm -hmm. we did at the beginning, but I think there's. Yeah, you not this year, but another year. Mm -hmm. It hasn't changed. Yeah. It's there. There's an org chart for facilities, and Ruthie Bennett is, of course, the facilities director. We have um, a pro an online process called School Dude, but mm -hmm. what happens is it's. It's, it's a priority of time sometimes uh, for people. <coughs> I think she would feel that she's understaffed and mm -hmm. underfunded mm -hmm. um, to reach out to all the needs that exist. And there are, every building has something and they're sometimes unique and, and it's often costly. Mm -hmm. um, I think um, Ms. Johnson is just coming back from capital as we look at even, you know, trying to mm -hmm. work with capital on some big projects, but sometimes they're there's studies, mm -hmm. and everybody wants the studies to come out of the school budget. Mm -hmm. So we're working this out. I think we've got, you know, good, very good working relationships mm -hmm. um, with central office and facilities to, to, to figure this out. 
but I think it's frustrating at the building level that because um, there's so much that needs to get done, it's it's the queuing of this is problematic. Yeah, I can understand you know instructional stuff and how many teachers you need against the schedule, but I, I'm not quite sure how to make this work from our seats here within the budget process. Well, I just want to let um, Diane talk a little bit about this in terms of one item on that spreadsheet mm -hmm. that you had and, and we have something we're going to need to think about going forward with, re with returns to facilities, Diane. Um, you know, basically before Ruthie came on board, mm -hmm. um, the all of the money for facilities maintenance was, you know, sort of under me mm -hmm. um, with Mark Miano. And my instinct, being extremely loath to overrun the budget, would be to hold back on anything that was non-essential. So health and safety, we did it. If we mm -hmm. had to do it, we did it. If we could wait, we did. Mm -hmm. It got towards spring, like, okay, we can start doing this, we can start doing that, mm -hmm. we can paint this, we can paint that. And likewise, I mean, since you never know what's going to come up and you mm -hmm. have a, a finite pool of money, you are going to delay projects that don't Im impact health, health and safety. Mm -hmm. You know, there's never enough money to go around. So, you know, to be able, you know, and so when Ruthie asked the question, where's this money coming from? Mm -hmm. That probably means it's not a health and safety problem. Mm -hmm. It's an aesthetic problem. It's a, another kind of problem. Mm -hmm. If it's health and safety, we do it. That's not a problem. But, you know, acoustic, I mean, I know the music rooms at the Audison have wretched acoustic tiles. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's not quite health and safety. Mm -hmm. You know, it's certainly a good thing to look at. And the use of the, the building revolving reserves has been used to front load the projects at the, the design for the Thompson and the Gibbs. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to be compensated for that. Right. But at the moment, they're a little anemic because mm -hmm. that's still in process. Mm -hmm. So I would say that the budget is sufficient to handle health and safety. Mm -hmm. It is not sufficient to handle aesthetics. Or, you know, in some, and I don't mean to say that lightly. You mm -hmm. know, it really, the aesthetics of a room really impact learning. There's no question about it. But you know, and, and how much do we really want to invest in the aesthetics of this building? Right, my, right. My feeling, just me, mm -hmm. not an educator, you know, this place is ready for the wrecking ball, so, you know, we're going to do what we need to do to keep it safe, but mm -hmm. we're not going to make it pretty. Mm -hmm. Mr. Hainer. Is heat, when, when does heat become Heat is health, health and safety. Thank you. <laughs> Unless it's like <laughs> July. Thank you. <laughs> in <laughs> July, it's not health and safety. Well, I, I, I'm not now, pushing the AC in all the rooms. Sorry, no, folks. No, 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 but, but heat. But like, heat, absolutely. Yeah. Like, you know, when we have heat pump things, you know, sometimes we'll nurse a fainting piece of equipment along and then mm -hmm. change it out over the summer. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, no. Heat, broken glass, wires. I mean, we're all over that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Dr. Um, I have a couple questions. Uh, first, you talked about the push to have students in um, like internships and other out of school and I, I can certainly see that it's helpful having fewer bodies in front of teachers and stuff but I wasn't wondering clearly we don't do it just because of that <laughs> or even mm -hmm. I mean that that's like a right slight side benefit can you talk about the benefits to the students of doing these things I mean so this initiative was not in started with the expectation that we were trying to get rid of kids so we didn't have to educate them um, the idea of learning beyond the school walls was something Dr. Bodhi and I have been talking about for years as something we wanted to build to making the senior year something that was more engaged with the community that was more engaged in lifelong learning um, that's both engaging for students and of real value to them um, the issue I was saying financially is how quickly we move and how hard we push um, does have a budget impact and can be a positive sort of win-win for students and for us um, the simple answer is that the more we are able to, and frankly technology helps a great deal with this, but the more that we are able to have students connect to the community, connect their learning to real life experiences, and then ideally the way you want to take advantage of that is bring that learning back into the school. So I don't know if you've all been invited, but please come to the intern to internship presentations. I will send that invitation to you. Great. When we're done, we'll be sending that out to everybody. Um, <coughs> finding ways to more consistently have that experience then be something that comes back into mm -hmm. the school is really powerful not just for the kids who had the experience but for the sophomore who looks and says you know oh you know in two years like right now I'm sort of writing you know an okay essay and reading some papers and understanding the political system but in two years I could be working in a senator's office mm -hmm. helping them figure out their you know their legislative agenda, which has happened um, with our students. Our students 
are kind of remarkable when they come back mm -hmm. and you hear the things that they get to do and the mm -hmm. things that they are considered to be significant contributors on, you know, at MGH and Senator's offices mm -hmm. working for law firms. So those are very powerful learning experiences, both for the students who have them and then for the other students who get to make a connection. And I also think, you know, the more we think about one of the great things about technology now is it really flattens our ability to reach out into and connect to the world. You know, it used to be kids would write a five paragraph essay and the two people who would read it would be them, their mom, and their teacher, and no one else would ever read that thing ever. And the reality is kids can write pretty meaningful things and they can now reach out with those things. And if you write a good essay that actually means something, you may send it off to the guy who wrote the book, because I've seen this happen, and they may write back to you, you know, and you may find out that you make that connection. Mm -hmm. um, and then that becomes a really, not just a powerful learning experience, but a real legitimate learning experience. They become creators of knowledge. Um, and so that kind of connection is something that we need to do, but we as teachers are not used to it either. So having the teachers even see the experience of the students brought back into the school, which is something we're only just beginning to do, is also really powerful. Thanks. So okay. actually, uh, Dr. Wright and I were talking recently that we would love to have you come back to us and talk specifically about the internship program in, in a future meeting, if we can arrange that at some point. We'll yeah, arrange nice that. Bring along, there's a, a bunch of other people, Ms. Kotzen Doc is who's Yeah, that, that would be and great. And also, um, the folks from community down at Edson has been helping out with that, and we have some mm -hmm. consultants as well. Yeah, that'd be great. Awesome. Great. I'd yes, Dr. Austin. Sorry. Andy. Yes. Um, so then you missed um, when I said earlier that basically we have no extra money. Um, I heard that. And yeah, okay. <laughs> anyway, so which thing would be your preference if we can only fund a few or things? Um, I mean, I have to say respectfully that our first priority has been a dean. Mm -hmm. I'm always a little nervous about saying our first priority has been a dean because the implication of saying that is that we can get by without a teacher. And then what happens is we get neither a dean nor a teacher. <laughs> um, the reason that's our priority is because it enables us to kind of keep things running smoothly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as I've sort of laid it out here, as much as you can give us towards the necessary teaching FTE to be able to smooth out um, and to provide the classes we need, the better. And to some extent, I know sometimes because we ask specifically, we get specific, um, you know, okay, we'll give you that point four and that point two. But if you're not giving us all of it, it's actually helpful that you give us some flexibility in how we use what it is we get. Okay. Because the reality is, if I know I'm getting three, I do a different shuffle than if I know I'm getting two. Mm -hmm. Neither of them are good situations to be in, but it's helpful to know in advance. Mm -hmm. That's helpful, thank you. Okay. Who else? Uh, so I have something quickly. Um, so one thing I want to point out is that there is a category that's not quite health and safety, but it's not quite aesthetics, which are restrooms, which I've heard from people that mm -hmm. students don't feel comfortable going to the restrooms. There's doors that are missing, and that's sort of that's something health. that I think we need to keep mm -hmm. on top of because that is that both has a social and emotional effect on students. It also has a physical effect on students potentially, even though it's not an immediate health and safety issue. Um, but then I, I actually want I actually to underline security. I know, I saw that. <laughs> I saw that. <laughs> well, I just wanted to point out that sometimes, you know, there's categories that maybe it's not like, you know, you're not going to freeze, but it's, it's still a significant problem. It's not just purely aesthetic. Um, I have a question. Uh, can you describe what a dean does for you? You know, just sort of what, 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 what would a dean what, be responsible for? We start with what they don't for? do. Yeah. Um, I mean, the deans are the first line of coordination around, I mean, first of all, they're monitoring students' attendance. Mm -hmm. But the monitoring of students' attendance is the way that they keep their pulse on which students may be falling through the cracks, because getting the kids to school is the most important thing and knowing the kids who aren't. So they're first, they're monitoring the students' attendance, but then they're running, particularly with our most challenging students and the discipline, the attendance, and the support teams. So more than anything else, they're the ones that become the first line of the relationship that they're going to build with the student, the plan that they're going to do with the student. They're running between guidance and harbor and everyone else to make that program work. Um, we hope that all the kids have relationships with the students, but the students who are most challenging and the students who are most likely to drop out or fail or not succeed um, are students who are on a first name basis with the deans and both ways. Um, and it's not a disciplinary relationship, it's a positive relationship, although discipline may be part of it. Um, 
in a given day, just you know, like day in the life of a dean, they're going to come to school, they're going to be checking attendance, they're going to be figuring out the kids that they're concerned about, whether they're here, whether they're not there. They're going to be meeting with angry parents and happy parents and going to 504 meetings and going to IAP meetings as one of the um, administrators there. Uh, they may well be going to as part of our student support team where all of the social work guidance um, and other support staff get together and problem solve about students who need support. And then out of that, they may be leading smaller teams and organizations. They meet with me and we talk about every kid we have an issue with, the kids that are out of school and kids that are in school. For students that are out of school for various reasons, um, it's worth noting you know, that Arlington has 140 group home beds, uh, which is um, a population which is constantly changing and often has students that may not come to school but still need to be educated outside of school. So those students, they may be working with or have part of that conversation. Um, then in the midst of that, they go down to the lunchroom um, where though they or the TAs, but they try to make sure that they're down there also to see kids, to make connections with kids. Mm -hmm. And then if there's any emergency during the day dealing with kids, which invariably is going to happen, um, it's them who's the first line of conversation on that. Um, so that's what deans okay. do. Great. Thank you. And then I've left out everything they do. In the midst of all that, the teachers are calling them for various different kinds of And they carry duct tape around with them. So if the teacher is out sick there and they're finding out why they're sick, they're you mm -hmm. know, making sure that they know where the teachers are, they know where they're supposed to be going, they're supporting them with kids. If they're having difficulty with kids, they're coaching them on what to do with it. Okay. Right Great. now, our deans have 650 kids on their caseload, and mm -hmm. so they can spend half of their day on attendance, mm -hmm. um, which is really important, but then slips between the cracks. So they oscillate back and forth. And we're doing all kinds of things to support them. We have more TAs doing that. We're doing, you know, trying to do things more technologically. We're working with the staff. There's all these kinds of things we do to try to spread that piece of butter a little bit more across the toast. Got it. Okay. Great. Thanks. Anything else? Mr. Hainer? Before or after the AEA presentation, my question's on the chart. Yeah, questions on the chart. I think, um, let's do that now. Okay, if you go to that yeah, chart. I have a bunch of questions. Oh. Okay, okay, so this is the, this is for, <coughs> partly for Ms. Johnson maybe, the chart that we, which is the last year's request and this right. year's request sort of merged together, is that right? By, by one. yes, yeah. mm -hmm. yeah. call it one. First question is, uh, there was one unfunded mandate, and it's way at the bottom and, I'm curious. It says uh, district-wide elementary math coach. I didn't know the state was un uh, mandating a math coach now. Mm. They're, they're, man they're mandating that we close the achievement gap. Right. And okay. So I, I just saw his math coach. And I mean, I'm trying to keep ahead. He's here. Do you want to talk to him? Oh, Mr. Coleman, do you want to oh, yeah, add something? Uh, oh, you have to speak I'm to the, the microphone, math. though, if you talk. Sorry. <laughs> it's a minor thing. I, I just I thought it was a little quirky. I, I wouldn't I wouldn't put a lot of credence into the check marks yet okay because yeah. we haven't refined that at this point we're still compiling it okay last year we weren't rolling this out in such a draft form it so. just struck me that yeah. that was a minor thing but yeah no uh, in full transparency that was a residual from last year just one that wasn't unfunded okay. so it's kind of rolled over so I don't know if those boxes have changed from year Fine. to year I'm sorry I didn't okay. mean to say no my other my Really serious question is the unit cost for teachers seventy three five. That's our average teacher salary based on the rollover for FY eighteen. Okay, my my concern with that is looking at the teachers contract. Mm -hmm. If we're hiring <laughs> positions, the, the, it's basically looking at positions uh, beginning anywhere from uh, step eleven under the bachelor's column or step eight uh, in the uh, the farthest one over. I'm just talking about hiring right now well, and we don't we budgeted an average because we're going to hire I mean and, and Rob did a great job with this this year we're going to hire the least expensive highly qualified person we can but there are positions that are extremely difficult to fill where we I, hire at the top I appreciate of scale that. Chemistry and that balances and physics, it out yeah. well I'm uh, special I, ed <laughs> some of the special ed positions are reading teachers I mean those are the high ticket ones I'm not questioning the the concept I'm just seeing an increase of four to five thousand dollars almost each year. Yes. Going forward, and and I'm at, that's why I'm asking these questions. Come so I, I take it, them. Yeah, from the average. Yeah, I'm hearing it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Questions, Ms. Starks? Yes. I had a few. Um, I didn't know this go. Um, so, I guess my question on that um, spreadsheet was that um, 
and I think you may have just answered it, is that um, it seems like everything, a lot of things that were asked for tonight are not on there. Is that um, I don't believe that's true. I didn't see anything on athletics. No, special... athletics is in there, but it's from the prior year. No, I don't. It's partially funded. So it was partially. It was... I don't, I don't see it in there at all. I think it's line 51. It's high school. Yes, it's line 51. Athletics. Oh, 121. Okay. Yeah. And so according to this, we funded nothing in 2017? Oh, no. We fully? funded it. We, we, so where are all the green items? All the things, they're gone. We funded them. They're no longer consideration for 18. They exist in the budget already. So can we get those as a, a, an, another page to this, I guess, is my question, because it makes it look like we didn't fund anything. Oh, no. We um, absolutely right. did. We, <laughs> we were trying to focus on that, which right. had not been funded, and okay. carry it forward. And, you know, it's... You have to make a call, and we just made the call right. to leave that right. stuff off. Um, or, the, or the portion that did not get correct. funded. Correct. So if something was partially right. funded, we, we, we moved The forward. partial is here. Yes. Right. The missing. unfunded portion. Uh, yeah, unpartial. Okay. Um, but I just noticed, like, here, the special ed ask on this spreadsheet for 2018 is only for five teaching assistants. On the sheet. On the sheet. Well, because there was a lot of things not funded last year. <coughs> oh, so everything else is. All the things that are colored were from, things that have carried from last year unfunded. So I guess we year. need another color maybe that is stuff that is rolling for this year that everything they have. Everything that's colored is rolling. Everything that's uncolored. No, but that's not new. true because her ask wasn't for all of this stuff. Th that rolled. So everything that was in last year that wasn't funded, yes. got rolled. Yes. Whether or not that continues to be a high priority, mm -hmm. we right. rolled everything. Right. Because it was expressed to me in budget subcommittee that was very important is to build a database of that which we have not yet been able to do. Absolutely. But so. I can't from this does not reflect what Ms. Elmer said. It does not reflect the priorities of the high school. Like the all of that stuff is still, I don't feel like it's, in yeah. here, and I just wondered how much more work was going to be done on this. I, I understand Quite a that bit this more. is not a finished product. That's what I, well, I that's it, what I was getting at, it, and it, I just wondered. It got out a little fast for my taste. Oh, okay. Uh, All right. So there uh, is more work that's going to be done. Dr. Alsnampi from Budget wants to. We we this. haven't seen it either before. Okay. We we did some talking about that we'd like to see the list again and yeah. things we didn't talk about real specific. Oh, okay. So we can. Right. I mean, I love this. It. I just as as they were talking and I was trying to compare it, it wasn't matching up and that was yeah, to we say the presentation of town meeting is going to be very different potentially than what than this type of document right it's going to be mm. we're maybe yeah. well, we're, 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 right. <laughs> you're, yeah. you're months ahead of I know, us. No, I know, I anyway know. but we felt that this was a useful mm -hmm. document to be looking at and mm -hmm. to express to the community what the need you know why we're right. asking for different things right I think we can fine-tune if things are no longer current top needs you know i think we can pull those out and put them somewhere else right so we're as not a supplementary page yeah, or something right right right, right. right. i mean and actually stuff. one thing i think will be very um heart-wrenching this year is how many of our highest highest priority needs we probably won't be able to fund right and that will be heart-wrenching right so we can say this is like absolutely the core mm -hmm. the really top top and and it's likely we still can't fund them all and that was going to be very hard yeah. Mr. Thielen. So the bottom line is the total proposed increases for FY18, 4.48 million. Contracted cost increases, and I know this is just estimates at this point. No, the 1.85 is a hard number. That is a hard number. Okay. I, okay. Um, the out of district tuition increases, the 1 million. That is my recommendation That's for what recommendation. we need. And, and there, it, could you just. What's the history behind that? What's the history of that? Well, right now we're um, about 750000 over our out-of-district tuition line budget, yep. and it's very early in the year, you know, and, and we've done the analysis very carefully. It looks like we're at about eight hundred right now for next year, but I have no faith that things won't change as we go through the spring, which is why I'm recommending a million dollars, because that will buy us a little wiggle room. What we will not have next year is any special ed reserves in either town or our own coffers. And so we're running thin, so I feel like we have to build a pad, and 200 is 200,000 is the minimum pad that I could stomach. Now, obviously, it's your decision, not mine, but I recommend a million dollars. And the, when the additional revenue of 3.17 million, so basically there's about $320,000 yep. 
to play with. Not to play with. That's, I mean, that's not a lot. Not a lot of money. And if we want to, uh, the, um, the building rental fund has traditionally been used to offset operating costs in the facilities budget. It actually paid for utilities. Um, if we want to truly set that money aside so that it isn't part of regular day-to-day -day operations, then we need to backfill 250000 into that budget. So if we were to do that, the money's gone. Yeah, basically. So, you know, that's, you know, and that probably won't be the highest priority when that's the only pool of money we have to work with. I mean, you know, reserve teachers that we always need, reserve TAs that we always need, all of the needs that you've heard of from the last two meetings. Um, you know, pretty much we don't have to lay anybody off. That's the good news. And we can cover our out-of-district special ed expectations. But pretty much, if we want any reserve teachers, that's, we're done. Yes, Mr. Hainer. Uh, I'd like to compliment this chart. I think this chart is, says a lot, uh, especially with the four columns to the left as they get filled out going forward. That first column, the enrollment growth, I think is very important for everyone to see, uh, showing the effects and uh, going forward. So thank you for that. For everybody that's involved. Oh, it's a group project, <laughs> yes. believe me. <laughs> okay. Great. Anything else? Okay, we are 20 minutes over, but we'll hurry along. <laughs> We've been pretty good. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, next is the AEA. A yes, AEA. Good evening. My name is uh, Chris Dangle, and I'm a very happy English teacher at the high school. On behalf of the high school staff, I, I really do appreciate this opportunity to address a couple of issues that are increasingly on our minds. The first pertains to the glaring lack of administrators in the building, and I'm very thankful that Dr. Janger pretty much hit 90% of our wish list, which is a great thing. You know, when the third dean was removed from this building five years ago, the, the faculty just did not really understand the implications of that decision. We actually thought, fleetingly, that it could potentially work with two deans. We were wrong, completely wrong. When three deans five years ago governed this building, uh, things ran surprisingly smoothly. It really, really did. Um, each of the deans was, was responsible for roughly 350 students, which, to be clear, was tough enough, uh, to be honest with you. Now, the two deans that are currently working here are responsible, as Dr. Janger stated, for 650 kids. Now, that is a huge number. That's actually double their workforce as of five years ago. So what was a busy job uh, then is, in many ways, objectively unrealistic now. It's just not, it's not wholly feasible. And in the end, the students are really the ones who lose out. And Dr. Janger did a really nice job of echoing that. Students are not able to form personal connections with deans who are just really very busy and oftentimes exhausted, which needs to be echoed. <coughs> What's more, if one of the deans is absent, which clearly does happen for understandable reasons, that leaves one dean in the building. So if a crisis should occur, which clearly does happen, then a dean is called forth to deal with a serious issue which can take up a half a day, which realistically leaves portions of the school unattended for most of the day. So that's a precarious, if not unsafe, scenario. To further complicate the situation, and again, I don't want to repeat too much. Dr. Janger did an awesome job, and I couldn't be more thankful about that. There are 1,300 students at, you know, clearly at the high school close to 100 of which are from recently established alternative education programs within the last year or two. Now these kids, as we all understand, are far more complex. They come here with emotional and cognitive challenges, the likes of which we have just not seen before. The deans are mainly responsible for these kids. In fact, I'm told by many reliable sources that this role alone is a full-time gig. It's a full-time job. So you lump that into what the dunes are doing, two, not three, and you can understand how complex that rule really is. For these reasons, we respectfully ask that we, or that 
you help to reinstate a third dean in the building. It just makes practical sense. Secondly, again, this is an echoing of what, an echoing of what Dr. Janger mentioned, but you know, Arlington High School has been recognized by local magazines and newspapers as one of the top 25 schools, high schools in the state. Something we should all be immensely proud of. The teachers are. We're grateful for it. We're grateful for the acknowledgement. But we do feel that in large part, that is a direct result of quality feedback, personalized instruction that we give all of our kids. It's the reason I love my job and I rely on it. That ability to have one-on-ones, personal connection, these are where, that's where learning really does happen. So as Dr. Janger again mentioned, classes, as you well know, are on the rise. So that is a clear threat. That's too strong. That's a, it jeopardizes our ability to provide direct, personalized instruction. And to, to be honest with you, it renders teaching more of a survival game than a proud, customized craft, which should be mentioned. And that is why we respectfully uh, request additional teachers to maintain our ongoing academic excellence for all of the kids, every single one. And I think it's very, very safe to say that we are all here for the same reason. We want our students to be safe. We want our students to be happy. And indeed, we want our students to be productive. Supporting these two vital and highly reasonable requests will secure a stronger, healthier education for everybody involved. So again, we would appreciate your consideration for an additional dean and understandable additional teachers. Thank you very much. Great, thanks. Thank Questions, comments? Mr. Slickman. So you're a very happy teacher. and I think that we're, we're thrilled to hear that. Um, can you tell us why you're so happy? <laughs> For every single imaginable reason. Mm -hmm. I love the town, I love my colleagues, I love the students in this building. Mm -hmm. They are grounded, hardworking, motivated, uh, just good, good young people. Mm -hmm. they, they make our jobs a genuine pleasure. I love coming to work. Excellent. Okay. Thanks. Questions? Others? Questions, comments? Great, thank you very much. They should, oh, I'm sorry. they should introduce themselves. Oh, I'm sorry, yes, please introduce yourself. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I, you have already, I know, yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, yes. My name's Alicia Maget. I teach chemistry at Arlington High School. Great, thank you. And Ms. Keyes. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Juliana Keyes. I am the AEA rep, but tonight I'm here representing Audison Middle School. Um, thank you so much for giving us a chance <coughs> to share our thoughts about the FY18 operating budget. We are getting ready to squish for one final year into Audison as a six to eight middle school. It's sort of bittersweet thinking about that. People are excited about new opportunities to come, but sad that our colleagues are gonna be splitting up. Um, our needs are few, but they're significant. And I think you'll listen to this and find a way to make it work. Um, in order to maintain the support our students need in this very large school, we need an increase in staff that supports the social and emotional well-being of our students. This means that we need an additional guidance counselor, more qualified TAs, whether that's through higher pay to recruit better candidates or better training for the TAs that we have, who are good people and working hard. Um, and we need more special education teachers and social workers. Um, our special ed program teachers right now work with multiple grades. They're often working with multiple clusters in each grade. And we've added a cluster to each grade in the past year, so that has increased they are pulled in too many directions to support all of their students at an acceptable level. The large population in our school, combined with the increase in students with social and emotional challenges, means that we need more staff to best educate these children. Adding more program and inclusion TAs would also help support our students and staff. And I just wanna kind of explain, I never thought I'd be the one sitting up here saying we need more um, guidance counselors and special ed and social workers as opposed to classroom teachers. Mm -hmm. If my class size goes up by from 25 to 27, that, that's a pain. That's a pain, it means the kids get less time. If I have a student who has significant needs, call the student Bob. Bob is not real, I'm not compromising anybody's <laughs> privacy here, Bob is not real. And Bob does not show up to class. I call the special education teacher, they say they should be there. 
I call the social worker, they're not answering the phone. I call the nurse's office, Bob's not in the nurse's office. I call the assistant principal, Bob is not with the assistant principal. I call the guidance counselor, they're not answering the phone because they've got a kid in crisis down there. I finally call the main office and have Bob paged. The main office calls me back five minutes later saying, did Bob show up? It's not the two extra kids in the class that make it challenging, it's the 10 minutes that none of those kids were learning because I was trying to find Bob. This is why we need more special ed staff, more social workers, more TAs, so that kids, you know, when Bob finally shows up, oh, he was sitting outside the guidance counselor's office, you know, th this is the kind of stuff that makes the job challenging. This is why we need more support mm -hmm. in those areas. Uh, we realize that this is a tight budget season and that next year both the Gibbs and the Audison will be getting considerable investment, so we want to keep this year's request modest. However, we respectfully ask that you recognize that our special ed and guidance counselors are working beyond capacity at this time and take steps to remedy that for next year. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, yes, Mr. Hainer. Could you expand on qualified TA, what you meant by that? Most of our TAs um, are working in programs with students on the autism spectrum, students with significant cognitive needs, or students with severe emotional or even traumatic backgrounds. And they're coming in off the street never having worked with those populations before. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank so, you. So some training, some training. Yeah. as to what that means and how to deal with students who have challenges like that. Thank you. Great, thanks. Did you, sorry, I, I cut you short, too short. Did you want to add something? Uh, no, I think I would uh, uh, stress what uh, Chris Dangle said. I would call myself a happy teacher here as well. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I think I really uh, appreciate the level of professionalism and how I'm treated like a professional and how you, know, you all take what are uh, ideas, you take them very seriously. Mm -hmm. And um, I've worked in places where that's not the case. So it's, mm -hmm. it is a wonderful positive thing. And I live here in town, so I really do love the investment in the schools because my own kids are going to coming up through these schools as well. I already have two of them in the public schools. So I'm a happy teacher and a happy parent. Great. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Good. No, no, I just want to make oh, a statement, yes, if I may. Mr. Uh, this is the second time the AEA has come before us, and both times the AEA and the administration have been aligned in terms of their discussion, they're both seeing the needs similarly, and it just demonstrates what a fantastic team of teachers and leaders we have in this district to, who collaborate well together and uh, are standing in a, a significant chunk of common ground. And I think that the AEA's priorities this year uh, were very altruistic and very thoughtful, and I'm very appreciative for, for what yeah. they brought before us. Yeah, yeah, it was good to have them. Mm -hmm. um, so before, I, I just want to say that um, we're looking to get school committee feedback uh, when we come back in January. So we thought we need time to digest all these presentations before yeah, yeah. we mm -hmm. give something, but I just wanted to throw that out too. Yes, sure. Dr. Allison. I was, I was just going to point out that this was the first, last year was the first time I think that they had come forward with budget requests, mm -hmm. but it was in public participation. This is the first time that we've had the AEA come as an item on the yeah, agenda. Yeah. And I think that it's, it was a good thing to hear from them. And, oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I'm, I'm glad they did. I mean, they asked, and we said yes. <laughs> so yeah. Well, no. we we suggested that they be. I mean, they asked if mm -hmm. they could come, but we suggested that they be put on the on agenda. The agenda. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Yes. I mean, yes. we being budget. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's great. Thank you. Yes. I uh, think, Mr. Hainer. I think it's very important to hear how much in sync the uh, teachers are with the administration mm -hmm. yeah. uh, that, uh, that showing the collegiality and the, the needs together. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Of course, this is going to be a bit difficult decision. So. Yes, it's going to be very difficult. And of course, um, one of the things that we, we look at, and we are looking at very carefully, is there anything that we could trim somehow to um, free up some additional funds, and we are going to take more hard. We are taking a hard look at it, and we'll continue to take a hard look at it. We'll talk to the uh, the AEA too, have them make some suggestions. Yeah. And I think that we're, we're, we all understand the constraints we have, and so how can we best prioritize and problem solve what we need? 
but as you can see what can happen is if we partially fund or somewhat fund th this list will just continue to roll forward in terms of what we do and, and I also just want to say besides the fact I think that we're all pretty much in sync uh, there's a lot of communication teachers and administrators and what is needed the, the, I think that's to be really applauded in terms of what's going on in our school district and in our schools um, they our teachers are really quite amazing they really are in terms of you know they, there's a lot of pressures certainly in this school but even at the middle school there's a different kind of pressure in terms of space and they're always stepping up mm -hmm. to do it you know you know and I just think of recent mm -hmm. thing what happened in Stratton teachers just stepped up and they know what to do and they help out so it's really quite uh, we're very uh, fortunate to have the, the staff we have yeah. Okay, so we are we're 20, 35 minutes over, but we're going to catch up. I'll make up the time. Well, <laughs> no, no, you we have go. questions for you. Um, actually, first thing, though, <coughs> I don't think we have this on Novus yet, right, the presentation? You have the presentation. What you don't have is there's, like, three slides that were added. Oh, oh no, I don't have any presentation. Oh, you took I it took off. Oh, okay. Because it was too big. Okay, oh, but, so oh, okay, but we'll get that. I can upload the Upload other it one. later. Yeah, you can upload the right, other one. So we, we do have a hard copy that we can look at yes. and follow along. Okay, yes. great. Thanks. And there's... I, as I said, I added three exactly. slides with graphics, and so because of that, it was okay. too big to be uploaded okay, to Novus. Okay. Um, if we upload it in a PDF format, it'll probably upload to Novus. Um, so I'm just going to talk very briefly about our major curriculum and technology initiatives to give everybody an update. Um, we have a major um, implementation in the investigations curriculum in uh, grades K and 1. Um, FOSS is a science curriculum that's um, now been expanded to grades K, uh, 1 through 5. We are expanding our workshop model in elementary uh, classrooms to include elementary reading. As you can recall, the Lucy Calkins writing program is also done in a workshop model. We are in the process of redoing social studies curriculum for grade 5. It will um, be much more focused and we're piloting integrated social studies and literacy units that were developed by staff over the summer. Um, that's to give students more um, facility with dealing with informational text, but also to help um, elementary teachers who are trying to fit all that curriculum into what is a relatively short day. Um, and we're working with um, at Audison and in the high school on the social studies scope and sequence of the curriculum. And we're also working at the high school and the middle school level at, on the examination of the readings that we do in English language arts mm -hmm. to make sure that we have the correct balance mm -hmm. of diversification of readings, but also of classics that students need to be exposed to before they move on. So what are we doing to support these initiatives? Uh, we have three literacy tutors that are um, paid for by Title I and three math tutors that are paid um, for, two of them are paid by Title I and one out of the general budget. I'm, in a minute, I'm going to show you a, um, a couple of slides on iReady, um, which is a new adaptive assessment that's being piloted in math at Pierce and ELA at Bishop. Um, we're piloting another kind of benchmark reading assessment at Bishop that's more something that's done by hand. We've had a formal course in supporting instruction for our teacher leaders that's been going on all year that's being taught in concert between, um, by Linda Hansen, who's one of our instructional um, specialists, and um, Teachers 21. We've had extensive PD for our literacy lead teachers, our literacy specialists, and our math coaches. Um, we're going to be running 10 mini courses on meeting the needs of all students. Um, yes, this is required for teachers to have 15 what they call PDPs or professional development points in order to recertify themselves in, in um, dealing with ELL students and meeting the needs of special education students. Um, but these were also extremely um, popular courses that we ran last year. And the vast majority of these courses are blended learning, so they may have one or two face-to-face -face meetings, and the rest of it is done online. And they generally focus around um, a, a book or a set of journal articles that people have found to be extremely helpful in this area. And um, the last thing is um, uh, PD to support uh, tier, tier one supports in reading at the elementary. So we've focused a lot of our supports in reading um, for tier two and tier three. 
Uh, tier three is almost exclusively special education students. Tier three tends to be a mix of special education and regular education students. Um, because of uh, Tammy McBride, who is our, one of our literacy specialists, because of her background as both of a, a, a grade one and a grade four elementary teacher, she's only been out of the classroom one year, um, and because of the work she did before she came to this district, she um, had been at another district, she's really been ha able to help um, our classroom teachers in the tier one. So looking at the student's uh, diagnostic reading assessment, the DRA score, what can we do to make implement, um, some inroads in the classroom as well as outside of the classroom for those students? So this is a sample of the um, iReady um, report. And the only thing I want to call to your attention is this is a class's report. And it shows for that teacher what percentage of their students or what number of their students are one year below, um, less than one year below, so basically on target or on or just about on target or on or above the grade level in the major areas that you would be looking at in terms of uh, reading. And this is from a fourth grade classroom. And so teachers were able to get this information and then they were able to see the average scale score for those students. And then they can drill down and they can look at the individual students um, scores in that area and then it actually makes recommendations as to what should happen in the classroom to, to intervene for those students in the regular education tier one classroom. Um, so the teachers that we have that are using this at Bishop have been very, very excited about using it and find it very helpful. And they are also able to extract portions of that to share with parents during parent-teacher conferences. So I should just clarify, sure. where does this data come from? This is this, from? Students take a, um, a, an assessment that takes anywhere from 35 to 45 minutes, depending on the student. Um, it's an adaptive test. so. Um, if the student is getting a lot of questions right, it makes it harder, right. it raises the bar for the student. If the student is not getting a lot of questions right, then it will make it easier for the student. Um, it mm -hmm. allows us to actually see what grade level the student is at at that point. And it's, it's sometimes referred to as a universal screener. So we can see all the way from the kids who are behind to we have several students that, that were coming up above the seventh and eighth grade level in the fourth grade. Mm -hmm. um. yes. I assume that 35 to 45 minutes, that's for one, either English or math, not Yes, both. that's correct. Okay. Yes, that's correct. Uh, this is a sample of an iReady report for an individual student. I, I redacted the student's name, but you can see where they are in terms of, and, and the specific levels in the areas of mathematics, geometry, measurement and data, um, number sense uh, and operations and algebraic thinking. And so again, teachers are able, and then you, if you look up at the, the right hand corner there, you'll see the margin of error, which is very low for this test. And it really allows us to drill down again for the student that's taking the math assessment where they need to go, where the teacher needs to go next with them. And the thing that we, we did was that we did a, a correlation analysis of the math scores from last year's park for our fifth grade students and a correlation analysis of uh, the ELA scores for the same fifth graders from last year for um, Park. And we, we saw something that's in between a 0.72 to a 0.75 range, which is pretty high for the first time these kids have taken the test. Mm -hmm. So that means that we're able to look at it and fairly accurately um, have a good handle on which students will have difficulty with the um, MCAS next generation. It also allows us to, we can repeat this um, assessment again at mid-year, we're get, getting ready to do it right after the first of the year, and then at the end of the year, so it's not sort of we have to wait till the end of the year to sort of get an idea about how the students would do on the next generation, we'll be having some indication. I'm also able to compare my results with um, my colleagues, um, the assistant superintendent in Bill Ricca and the assistant superintendent in North Reading, and we're able to look at what their results are as well as ours. So we'll be able to compare how we're doing compared to them. In terms of technology expansion, um, we purchased Chromebooks so that, that will allow all fourth, fourth grade students um, to take the um, MCAS 2.0, which it was originally called, now it's called MCAS Next Generation, um, online. Those Chromebook, Chromebooks were also purchased at um, the middle school so that all ELL students can take the access test, which is the test for English language learners, also online this year. Um, we implemented, as you know, a BYOD program 
in the, uh, at Audison at the high school and teacher machines were replaced in, uh, at Audison and two elementary schools. And we have presented to the Capital Committee regarding our annual request and have received favorable results. So one of the questions is, with all this technology expansion, um, and I know we've heard in the past that not that there's uneven implementation going on, and so I want to um, show you this chart. It's a little hard to read, but on the far left, you'll see the innovators. That's, those are the, the people that are ready to jump in right from the start. And then we have our early adopters. Those are people that once there's a few people around them, <coughs> then you'll see this, what they call the chasm. And I'll we'll talk about that in a second. And then we have what we call the early majority. And as you see, when we get to that point, it says that about half the staff is at the same place. And then we get into the late majority. Um, Dr. Bodhi and I went to a, with a number of uh, teachers and administrators, went to a conference um, this week um, sponsored by the Massachusetts Personal Learning and EdTech Consortium. And this chart was shown, and they said to move people or to get that, that uh, group of people within a school, to move from those who are early adopters to expanding to those that are the early majority is the most difficult um, to get. That when you get to the halfway point where you have half of your people that are either innovators or early adopters or early majority, it's a lot easier to get the people on the other side. And I think that's what we're experiencing now at, at some of the schools, and that's why we're getting this unevenness where there are some teachers that have really jumped in with both feet, and as you heard at the high school, um, teachers at least have some amount of presence, but we have um, teachers at the high school that are using um, the uh, Google Classroom you know, very effectively, and then we have other people that are hardly using it at all. The same thing exists at the middle school. I would have to say that this is less the case at the elementary school, mm -hmm. but we've had iPads in the elementary school for five years now. So I think that's one of the things that we're seeing. So what are the supports we're doing to try to help with that chasm? This past summer, we had a tech a university, an annual thing that we've had for the last three years. Our summer curriculum work now involves incorporating technology um, something that I didn't put up there is that uh, we are also offering teachers who would like to do work um, during the vacations from now until the end of the school year um, to redo uh, curriculum maps or to update curriculum maps showing how technology might be incorporated. We're offering teachers the um, a stipend to do that. We recently had an ed camp at Audison, which was extremely successful. An ed camp is where teachers come together the schedule is put up there that we're gonna have three 40 minute slots and these are the rooms that we're gonna use and teachers were able to put what they wanted to learn about or talk about on a sticky and put it up on, they, they could propose and then they would go to the rooms and they would self facilitate. And um, I don't know, did you wanna? Um, it, it worked out really well. I think we kind of branched beyond technology yes. in a few areas, mm. but that was good because there were things people felt they needed to talk about. It was great. I went to one. I learned all about Google Expeditions on the iPad, where the kids can take an iPad and like move it around as if they're actually looking around sites around the world. So I'm excited to try that in my classroom. Um, so I guess the the la and the last thing is that we've uh, added some additional staffing at Audison to support teachers, and we've increased increased our internet capac capacity. However, the state is projecting that what we need for internet for the future will be one gig per every thousand students. So while we have more than some people have, um, we have way less than what the, they're projecting that we will need. Um, David Good is in the process of working with his staff. Um, we filled out some state questionnaires. We're gonna be sending them in um, and, and there's a possibility that we would get some additional funding. Uh, the other thing we're looking at is we were able to see through this process what other districts are paying. And it's very interesting that districts that have the same internet service provider as we do are getting, some of them are paying more than we're paying for the same thing. And some of them are paying less than we're paying for the same thing. So we're, we're investigating what that is. Interesting. Yes, Mr. Hainer. Did you say one gig? of memory for no, no of, of internet capacity <coughs> for internet every capacity thousand. for for every thousand so for, every thousand. Like they, for us would be pro, uh, for safe six gig right yeah and we don't have that oh no we're waiting we're like so, a fifth yeah. of that not <coughs> half even. a gig 
We have half a gig. We have half a gig right now. Dr. Allison, if you want. So we need 10 times what we <coughs> currently have. Yeah. That's what the state is projecting. Right now, this is not immediately. What? This is not immediately. They're saying for the future. Yeah. I, and a lot of that has to do with video because video takes up a lot of bandwidth. And we are seeing that the more video our teachers are using, the more bandwidth we're starting to use. And we're doing a lot of um, analysis on our um, network traffic. Yes. Can Mr. we Hanna. get any of that through ACMI in the renegotiation <laughs> aspect of it? I, I believe that that would come through our the, the ISP and ISP is RCN and that's been already well, negotiated. It's our. Oh. Mm -hmm. But but I, that was negotiated with that in mind. Um, the last thing I want to just bring up <coughs> uh, this is being part of Maple. We're one of the twelve. Um, what they call catalyst districts, which are the districts that were invited across the state because of our work in personalized learning, that which is supported by technology, but not exclusively um, with technology. Uh, we, one of the things that they said at the presentation that I thought was really interesting is that in Massachusetts, we rank, if we were to rank ourselves as if we were a country, we rank in achievement number one in NAEP in 2014, which is the National Assessment of Educational Progress. So Massachusetts would be number one. But if we look at Massachusetts closing the achievement gap, we would be number 48. So the personalization of learning and the use of technology to better meet the needs of all students is important because of that disparity, that although we are performing well, there is a percentage of our population that is not performing well. And the, the use of technology allows us to sort of scale up personalized learning because we've heard all night and we heard last week that classes are 25, 27, 28, 30. And for a teacher to be able to personalize learning for every student in that classroom without the assistance of something to help us ramp up to scale is, is almost impossible. So does that come with additional funding from the state? The no. <laughs> professional development. We there is some professional. Development. There is some professional okay. development. Yes. I, I will say the, the Maple is a is a Desi private. It's Learn Launch, mm -hmm. and Desi coming together in a partnership. Uh, that chart that you saw about adapt adapting technology mm -hmm. in a school or a school district, you can just take that same idea in terms of a state, mm -hmm. and. Arlington is one of the early people, early districts that have sort of moved in this direction. We're still on a continuum too, uh, but it's a mindset that we're trying to move toward in terms of personalizing instruction, both for the achievement gap, but but also that level of engagement um, that we've heard we've heard a lot about social emotional um, barriers for kids to be able to learn. I, our, our, th our theory on this, and, and I think that we're uh, certainly supported by research, is the more we can even move into this area, we may be able to gain the engagement of some students that might not be as engaged. And um, you, you sort of got to be here in school, and you got to be doing something in order that you're going to be learning. So it's, a, it's also a hook that we would use that would be helpful. You know, the kind of work that you see with iReady, you know, it's one of the things that we, we see in pockets, we certainly see this at the kindergarten, believe it or not, across the board, is creating goals. And when you have, when, when students can see their, follow their own um, progress, that in of itself has some motivation. Some teachers actually create little portfolios in their class so students can monitor what they're doing um, in different skill areas. So we're moving in a direction. We're certainly not there. It's, it's a process. But what we've come to understand is that we're more there than many other districts. So we're on the early end of things. And, and, and the idea across the state is to create the professional development, the nurture the districts are doing it so that we become um, models for other schools to come and, and learn what we're doing. So the technology to support teaching and learning, um, we've heard a lot about iReady. One thing I want to, else I want to say about iReady is that the students loved it. 
they were saying to their teachers, when are we going to do this again? <laughs> because as they're taking the test every so many minutes, it shows them this little video, like a cartoon or something, that they do play like a little game, and then they go back to Reward the test. Them. And so it sort of rewards them. <laughs> um, you've heard about the blended learning mini courses. Um, we're expanding the data that we have in Baseline Edge, which right now is for elementary teachers. Um, it, right now we've put all last year's park data in there, so a teacher can sit down and say, show me students who did not make the DRA benchmark who also did not meet the standards in park, and it will actually bring that up for them, and they can see the demographics for those students. How many are special education? How many are ELL students? How many are in 504s? Um, we have been sharing videos of classroom exemplars for literacy and we're pre preparing to do similar videos for math and teachers are giving us great feedback about that. Um, it really helps teachers to be able to watch a video. A lot of times teachers are a day behind the person that's putting up the videos. So they're putting up a video, this is what I did yesterday in my class, this is what worked, this is what didn't work. And then a teacher who might be um, early into the Lucy Calkins program will watch that video and then do it the next day in their class. Mm -hmm. Questions, comments? Yes, Mr. Cardin. Uh, are you going on to the next slide? Or? Yeah. Oh, oh, I think we're, are we I done? I was done. We're done, oh, I think. <laughs> oh, this is the future. Okay. Yes. okay. So we're going to be meeting with teachers regarding um, our technology plan and opportunity for feedback. Right now we're looking at whether we should change the devices at um, grades four, five, and six. Um, and what devices we should continue to purchase for seven and eight. There will be two community meetings. One is going to be with um, Vision 2020, which is going to be called Reinventing Education, and we'll be talking about what we're doing in that area. Um, and also I would like to get some feedback from parents on the Instructional Technology Plan and other members of the community. Um, we're hoping to expand the computer science curriculum in the next school year, as you heard people request that. Um, we'll be having a parent and student camp for students who choose BYOD. I think that was one of the things that we really were not sure that we really thought the students were more prepared to do BYOD. Um, and so we really thought we, we think we'll have a camp um, a couple of evenings the people all people have to choose from is one evening um, and in the summertime so that parents can see how we use computers um, and how students can use their device and for students to know how they could use their device even if their teacher is not incorporating that as much in the curriculum how they can use it for their own self um, curriculum leaders are working on vision of the student as learner and vision of student as citizen and we are going to get some stakeholder feedback around that and that will kind of drive that's the what we want to do and the how we want to do it partial is from things like student engagement um, student center learning we're working on that and um, so we'll do define um, what uh, steps are necessary to um, get at those visions and so you'll be hearing more about that in the spring uh, Mr. Carton. Thanks. So um, it, it sounds like you are refining or redeveloping the technology plan. And I think that's, that's vital because you know, I, I it was one developed a long time ago, but it's still unclear where we're going. Like from sixth grade, we're all one to one. And then seventh grade, it's totally hit or miss. They go for you know, days of using technology unless they want to. I and think that varies from elementary classroom. Elementary schools, yeah. you know, at elementary schools, you know, um, some of our schools are one-to-one, -one, some of them aren't. Um, some of the, uh, you know, at lower grades are using iPads, and then suddenly they're switched to Chromebooks. So it does seem like we're all over the place. We need to sort of have a, a long-range plan of where we're going to go. Um, so I would strongly encourage you to do that and, and talk with parents as well because, um, you know, certainly for, um, uh, you know, my, my son was in an experimental third grade class where it was one-to-one -one and there was a lot of mixed reaction to that, whether mm -hmm. that was appropriate at that early of a level or not. So, um, but I do think we need to sort of know where we're going. Are we headed to one-to-one -one mm -hmm. for middle school and high school? Uh, is that our goal? That how are we gonna, if that's our goal, how are we going to get there? Are we going to impose a policy that people have to bring a device unless they can meet you know, a demonstrated need like other towns have? Or are we going to continue with this hit or miss? You can bring one if you want, but right. um, what does that create in classes where a few people have it, but the rest doesn't? So certainly I think we need to be very more strategic about where we're going, and then we can try to figure out how to get there. Mm -hmm. It's been our policy to try to pilot things so that we can get a sense of 
what the acceptance level will be with not only with the teachers but all, also with the parent community. So that's why initially we allowed BYOD at sixth grade because we knew we had one to one. So if a student didn't bring one, there was one that was provided for them. This year when we did BYOD at the middle school, we had 350 parents that did that. But as I said, I think that we learn from everything. Not everything goes perfectly. Um, I th one of the things that they also stressed at the Maple Conference is that we need to create an environment where it's okay to take a risk. However, I totally agree that we're poised right now to redo our technology plan and, and get a better feel for it. And that's why I want to have a parent meeting. Mm. Yes, Dr. Asenampi. As part of that technology plan, I hope that we're going to be working with capital to look at whatever our plan is we need to be able to fund it because mm -hmm. we're talking about having devices that are five years old and we have to replace them all and and if we if the funding stream isn't there i don't think we should be i mean we should be trying to get it there if, the, if we see that that's the need if we can't make it i I think for us to be having tech plans that we can't fully fund, that's that's a big problem. When I go to Capital, um, they always ask me to give um, a technology budget for three or four or five years out. And up to this point, we have an agreement that we would, you know, what the replacement cycle would be. The, um, the difficult part is that the en enrollment and the need and the desire for people has gone faster than we expected. So if we looked at what we had for devices when we started down this road with capital three years ago, um, we would have uh, probably anywhere from a three to four year replacement cycle. Um, that doesn't mean we throw things away because we right. certainly don't do that. Right. Um, but the number of devices that we have in the district has ramped up so fast and the desire for teachers as you heard from the elementary teachers that was one of their highest priorities from the aea um that that it's become difficult with the same amount of money to replace and, and so that's one of the reasons why we brought out byod to see what the sort of the appetite in the community would be for that because that would help us through that process thank you Mr. Hainer. Any, oh, sorry. Sorry. Any yeah. thought of uh, dealing with the technical people that are in town to try to partner us, partnership with uh, businesses and stuff, tech companies and stuff, to get either donations or directly involved? Burlington does a lot of it. Burlington literally uh, has they have connections companies with, there. with computer yeah. companies in the town yeah, and yeah. stuff. But, that, but I'm just thinking uh, out of the box creatively. Well, we have had um, people from the community that are in the tech field as advisories, and that they actually set sort of where we were going with the computer science um, electives and stuff like that. I, I just want to caution is that Burlington actually has a line in their budget of a million dollars per year that they do from their capital from their own operating budget for technology. The va vast majority Smaller of their budget district. is yeah, very <laughs> very little actually comes from outside donations. Uh, Dr. Brady. Right. One of the things that I think that uh, is certainly in the vision going forward is that the high school is going to be one-to-one. -one. That, that is, by the time that we get the high school um, rebuilt, and that that is going to be, in fact, we may even be behind where we should be at that point. But it's one of the things that we will certainly be looking at. There will be a technology um, uh, line item as part of the project, that line item is probably going to be insufficient. And high schools that um, know that that's a direction they want to go, and I think that there would be unanimity here that that would be a direction we should go, are probably going to have to supplement that. And uh, districts that have done that, it's been in the tune of a couple million dollars. Now relative to the cost of the whole high school, that's not significant. But I, I just alert you to that, and, and, and actually saying this to the community as well, is that I think that when we get to that point, which isn't going to be that far off when we have to go for an override in the high school, um, I, I think that that is something that we need to make sure that we have the additional funding for so that we can go. Now, it could, it could be that we will be able to um, implement some of that even earlier, but th that is part of the plan going forward. Yes, Dr. Yes. And, and and I just add, add that it's not a one-time buy. I mean, the first time right. we're mm -hmm. buying it, but then we have to, to be it. scheduling mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. replacement. You know, we can't yep. just 
buy it once. That's the problem. Right. Yeah. Many yeah. districts then go to a leasing model, but they have to, as you said before, mm -hmm. you have to know that the capital stream, and we have very small amounts that we lease that's not funded by capital, mm -hmm. um, but you have to know that, that that stream, that funding stream is going to be there. But yeah. in order to afford um, that many, and also to keep the technology current for the same right. amount of money, mm -hmm. many right. people have gone to a, um, a leasing structure. And also, many districts have also gone to parents having to pay for a maintenance fee. Mm -hmm. okay. So I, I just want to talk to his parents. <laughs> I, um, I have a middle schooler and a high schooler. We have devices for both of them, but they chose not to bring them. And I think um, because they feel that there's no use for them, they're not being used in the classroom. Um, and for us, I know, um, unless we have a reduction in the amount of three ring binders my kid has to bring, you know, adding an extra piece of weight that's not going to be ever used in the classroom. Yes, she could bring it out and use it on her own, but, but the teacher's never requesting it. Um, you know, that I think is that gap that feels like, you know, I, and, I, and I do think that there are other parents who would be, have the financial means and be willing to buy devices for their kids if they really felt like they were integrated into the classroom and felt, and felt like there was reduction in the binder requirement. Mm -hmm. I have to say, those things, is a, I mean, these are not huge kids, and those are big binders that they have to carry around. So I mean, I know we're, we're in transition. Institutional change is hard. Um, I suspect that in a few years, kids won't be carrying those big binders. I hope that's true, but I, I, I just know that I think that's the barrier from my perspective as a parent, yeah. Uh, okay, thanks, anything else? Great, thank you. Um, so superintendent's report. Well, this won't be that lengthy. Um, so one of the things that we've agreed is we'll have a quick update on where we are with the different schools. Uh, the, the Thompson School is moving forward. They're already starting to see um, fencing and some of the work that's being done. I, don't, I can't tell you what date they're going to actually put the first shovel in the ground, mm -hmm. but it's coming very soon. And it's going to be frozen. <laughs> well, hopefully it will thaw again yeah. on Saturday. But uh, one of the things that we will be notifying neighbors about when we hit the schedule is it's probably going to need to be some Saturday work uh, but, but as we've done all along, when we have some big changes, we know something, we'll get a letter out to them. But uh, I've, I've been, and the town manager have been reassured uh, this week that the architects and the contract, the construction company mm -hmm. feels that we're, we can meet our timeline. So uh, I'm glad we have the modulars in place um, as we approaching winter just to see how, how that all works out. But I, I, I remain confident on that. With respect to Stratton, that is remaining on schedule. We've actually had a meeting this week about F&E, which is furniture and equipment, mm -hmm. and looking at and, and trying, because a lot of the, the uh, ordering has to be done, as you can understand, early. Or, so there'll be a reach out to teachers um, to get some, get some ideas. What, we have been funding. Um, we have been funding uh, Stratton over the last few years. Um, every year, a little bit more money toward furniture, and so I don't. I don't. We're not. We're going to continue to use those that furniture. So what that will do is we'll f um, provide some additional space to do some other mm -hmm. some other work. Probably be along the lines of technology, but we'll let you know about that. That's going well. Um, I will say one of the issues that we're going to face tomorrow, just as an aside, it's really not about the construction schedule, but we, we built these breezeways, <coughs> which was the, oh, yeah. the best way to do this, to connect the modular, modulars to the school, the cafeteria and the gym. They are not heated. They are wind barriers completely. But they're not heated. And I have to say, having been in them last week and, and the principal reporting today, they are cold. So it, it is a little bit of an issue for tomorrow. Um, so we have a, a plan going forward for <coughs> what we're advising about dressing tomorrow. <coughs> That's the problem in terms of the winter there. We're in, in there. You just can't put heaters in those breezeways. There's just really not going to be effective. It's just a waste of right. electricity. 
So that is it. That's a challenge. So I hope we have a mild winter as we go forward. <laughs> May I just add? Yes, Mr. Right. Permanent Town Building Committee will be meeting in this room next Tuesday night at 7:30. Okay. The major topics are all the ones that Dr. Mm. Bodie just. Uh, so if anyone has an intent to come. It won't be at the town is hall. It, is it, it on all the buildings, or is it just on the, Stratton? The major, right now, the Permanent Town Building Committee is dealing with Thompson, uh, Stratton, and Gibbs. That, those are the topics. <laughs> those are the buildings, right. yeah. So, mm -hmm. But it'll be here one time, mm -hmm. not at the town hall, at 7.30, Tuesday Got night. It. Good to know. Good. Okay. Well, Gibbs is going forward. We've worked out, uh, I think, a plan now that, uh, that meets all of our needs in terms of all of the different programming and special education, ELL, reading, and et cetera, et cetera. So the floor plan is there, which now allows the beginning of the costing out. And so we had a meeting today um, for the first, the first stage of that, and um, so far so good. So that will be, we're really staying on a very strict timeline for that, so uh, I'm feeling very confident that we will uh, meet the goals of opening in 18. Do you do you know when the next presentation to the community would, would be? Um, we haven't set the date yet, but you know, it, <clears throat> it. We thought it would be this month, and actually, it could be, but it's it would be next week, and so mm -hmm. we decided that next week probably not the best time to do it. And frankly, I don't have any nights free <laughs> next right. week, so that has one issue too. So. Um, we're going to schedule something um, after the first of the year. Mm -hmm. So in January. Yes, and then we'll get the advisory committee. I have to get the teachers to um, um, work on that piece of it. Well, Juliana and Jason and I will talk about that. But the, the advisory committee really won't have any um, need to be advising until we get later in January. So, some of the work that's been going on right now is not the work of an advisory committee. It's really into the the bones of the of the programming and the layout of the floor plans. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, Gibbs Stratton and, and the high school. Um, we um, continue to move forward. Next week we're going to have the first building meeting. Mm -hmm. um, it's really basically just to give the committee an overview of the process because I think people are in different levels of understanding of what is involved in being on this committee. What's the process? What are some kind of timelines? So it's really uh, really informational. And this meeting is next <coughs> Tuesday. And what is the, the time? It is in the evening. It's, so it's in the evening here, and it's here. Oh, wait. Didn't you just say that the permanent time building yeah. was meeting here? Yeah, these meetings at 6. Oh, oh that's at 7.30? Permanent time building it's, is at 7.30. And this is at 6. That, that's right, okay. and it was to come, pull the two together. But, and that's why Permanent Town is here, because there's some members of Permanent Town that are on the building committee, and it was just made it easier. Got it, okay. I got it. It's stay here. Okay. Right, and the School Enrollment Task Force is on Wednesday. Yeah. And the School Enrollment Task Force is on Wednesday in the same room. Here. And there's here. concerts and other wonderful events happening all week as well. <laughs> all week, yes. right. Th that's all the good news. Yes. So that's, what, that's sort of a quick wrap up of uh, where we are. Now the other two things that you have in there, uh, you have the official uh, certified <coughs> copy of the DESE mm -hmm. certified enrollment numbers. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's there for your information. As I said last time, that it turned out that by coincidence, the number was the same as it was in one of those recent charts. I think that has changed since then, but that will happen all the time. Mm -hmm. Then the other, it's really not something I want to talk to. It's just in your packet. It is a it is a newsletter from Edco, just to keep you apprised of the the work that's going on in that collaborative. I will say that it is, uh, in terms of our use of Edco um, as as administrators and teachers, we continue to use the professional development. And I think that the roundtables that we participate in many, many job functions um, have, are just terrific. In fact, we're going to add a couple of roundtables in which uh, Karen Fitzgerald probably is going to participate. So getting the, the people who are the sec secretaries to the school committees together because they have a lot 
that they need to talk about as well. So there, we're always looking to see wh where can we create professional opportunities for different, um, uh, for different people with specific job functions. So all is, all is going well there at the moment. Great. Questions, comments? Nope. Okay. Great. Great. Is That's that it? it? That's it. Great. Thank you. Um, consent agenda. All, all items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine and will be enacted with one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests, in which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence. Approval of warrant, warrant number 17092, dated 12-8-2016, in the amount of $497,701.57. Approval of minutes, school committee regular minutes, 12-8-2016. Approval of proposed Arlington High School performing, performing tour, New York City, May 19th through 21st, 2017. Excuse me. Yes. I just need to ask Ms. Fitzgerald, is this warrant the one I'm on? No, the one, warrant. No, oh, okay. No, fine. That's one being signed. The okay, fine. Signed. Thank you. And the warrant that I'm on, though. Yeah. So you right. can. So, you have so to, I. You have we have to pull it out, and you have to. Abstain. Yeah. Do it I'll separately. pull it out. Okay. So I'll pull that out, and we'll vote on the other ones. Any any other plots? Okay. Okay. All those in favor of the two items, please signify by saying yes. Aye. Yes. Aye. yes. yes. Um, okay. Then the the item that's pulled out, the um, warrant. All in favor? Aye. 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 And I'm abstaining. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, that's it. Uh, now we want to go on to um, the policy that we saw last time, uh, teaching about alcohol, tobacco, and drugs, for a second reading. Mr. Hainer, do you want to? I would defer to Mr. Uh, Schlickman on the procedure of this. Do we take a vote at this time, or do we just seek any more questions uh we vote to adopt. okay we vote. it's second reading i i would uh move that we accept the policy as presented second, second. okay so moved by mr hanner seconded by dr allison ampe um all in favor or is there any discussion on the motion okay all in favor aye. Say aye. 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 aye aye opposed abstain okay unanimous um okay subcommittee and liaison reports Budget, Dr. Alice Nampi. Um, <coughs> budget will meet on January 10th. Great. At six, here. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, community relations, Ms. Starks. Um, so we did, I, I know that you reported on this last week. Um, Quickly, a little bit. yes. Um, so we had our first, um, this was what we put up on the table at the kickstand. Hmm. Um, it just said, so that people knew why we were like sitting there not talking to anybody. I thought it would be weird if we're just sitting there. I mean, we had we a very nice, each other. we had a very <laughs> nice conversation. Um, so we had this, I'm happy to make this for, um, if anybody else wants to do this. So my idea was, and Jennifer and I just decided we would pilot it as mm -hmm. community relations members. Um, my idea was that we would do it on the first Saturday of every month mm -hmm. for an hour from 11 to 12. Um, and I made sure that I am available, so I am happy to be there. Um, but my thought was if we started and we, I did it, it we started in December because um, that meant that it easily meant the math worked out that each of us, if each of us does two weekends, right. We're done. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I'm happy if people don't want to do it to step in. I made sure that I was available on any days. But mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, like I, like I heard you say last week, a lot of people stopped by, told us they appreciated the fact that we were doing it. No one had anything they wanted to talk <laughs> about. But um, mm -hmm. even the people at Kickstand thought it was a great idea. They didn't think we were going to be there long enough. And I thought, well, but it's our first try. We'll be back. Um, so um, I don't know if we need a motion. I think we should vote on this. I to, think, yeah, a motion to, to decide to do this, to, to do do this. this and then um, and then if it for this if, year for this year, if it passes, then you would send out a doodle where people can sign up. Yeah, and people mm -hmm. can can with doodle they can you know swap with someone or you know. Oh yeah, yeah, and you can always like, let me know. Like I said, yeah. I'm I'm happy to be the backup. Right. I can do any and all of the of and the then, weekends. And then we establish this. We can actually. Uh, do maybe an even better job, even though the job that you did was fabulous on advertising it, just sort of sending Yeah, yeah, I like, yes. I totally forgot the list, yeah, yeah. like yes. the Arlington list. We got it in the paper, we got an email out yes. to parents, yes. but we didn't hit the list. Yes. And so, yeah, and you know, it's just little list. things like the that. So I would do right. it yeah. next time, mm -hmm. right, right. Um, so, so, move to do it. Okay, so motion, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Hainer, move to do it. Move to do it. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> do you want better language? 
Uh, move that the school committee holds school committee chat hours from 11 to 12 on the first Saturday of the month for every month, January to June, all members to sign up for two slots. Okay. And, and, and let's make it clear that it's, it, this is a trial year, and then we'll, we'll reassess it after the end of it. Okay. Seconded by Mr. Hayner. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Um, I think it's unanimous, yeah. Good job. All right, cool. Um, and I will, um, once we get the doodle out, I will always make sure that this is updated with people's lists. And I know that um, we all get buttons. Mm -hmm. From um, town meeting. From town meeting, mm -hmm. because, you know, they make them for us, even though we're, whether or not you're a town meeting member. And I would recommend that you wear your button. Mm -hmm. um, Jennifer and I both wore buttons. I wore my campaign button. because I can't uh, But anything just so, they, <laughs> yes. so that you have your name on there, yeah. just so they can tell you apart. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. it wasn't obvious who was who. They might I'm know. They might know. <laughs> yes. Right. Okay. All right. Um, and we don't we don't have another meeting yet planned, but probably in January because I know that mm -hmm. hopefully some of the work on the dashboard will be done. We'll start talking about that again. Great. Good. Um, District accountability curriculum instruction and assessment. Well, we had sort of a non-meeting on Monday <laughs> in that uh, we didn't have a quorum, but we had interesting people to have a nice conversation. Uh, uh, Jack, uh, from, Snyder. Uh, Jack Snyder. Jack Snyder from MCIEA came and talked about the consortium. And uh, Dr. Chesson, Dr. Bodie, you, myself. Um, uh, we had Scott Lever was here and yeah. Jason Levy was right, there. Right, Jason Levy was here. So uh, we had a nice conversation about what MCIEA is and possible implications should Arlington decide they want to pursue membership in the consortium. Right. And that's what we talked about. Um, Do you want to describe briefly what the consortium is? The consortium has is a group of districts. Right now, uh, it's... Uh, six districts. Six districts. Yeah. It's uh, Attleboro. Boston <laughs> is participating with a subset of schools. Revere, Somerville, Winchester, and Lowell. So that's why I'm involved in my role in Lowell. Uh, and th there are two streams. One stream is to improve the uh, accountability system because under the new federal laws, there's an opening for us to change the way we do accountability. Uh, there's so much good things that are happening in the Arlington schools that don't end up in the um, accountability measures of what a quality school is. And the, the teachers here tonight talked about being happy for a lot of reasons, because of the kids, because of the support from the community, for, for many reasons. And these are truly measures of quality schools that are not included in the current accountability system. Uh, performing arts is something we're very strong at, which uh, uh, is, I think, an essential part. Uh, visual arts, performing arts, music, uh, uh, anything that is not an MCAS tested subject really does not get included in terms of a description of the quality of a school. And one of the tasks will be to come up with some better way to determine school quality that, that actually uh, resonates and reflects on what's, what's really going on in a building. And the second, is, second part is uh, about developing uh, a series of authentic assessments uh, rather than just using MCAS or PARC or whatever that, that accurately reflect student learning and there's a focus on uh, assessments that are teacher generated and the buzzword in education is authentic. Um, districts do not have to participate in both streams. They can choose to way towards one or the other or do participate in both. One of the things that, that came out from the discussion that we had was that um, in many ways on the authentic assessments, uh, Arlington is pretty far along on this and that there'd be a sharing relationship with Arlington and other uh, districts, but uh, there'd also be resources and money for uh, common planning time, uh, teacher work, uh, in addition to what we're able to afford. So there are benefits to us and there are benefits to the consortium to have Arlington in. Uh, but the governance of this is such that you have, uh, as the board of directors, the superintendent of each participant district and the president of the uh, teachers association in each district. Both must agree to join. 
both must agree to the participation levels of the district um, and both have a, a, an equal vote. So this is a really teacher-centric operation. Uh, we had a board meeting today and the discussion, the teachers, re, uh, the teachers associations really play a strong role in the governance of the uh, consortium. And we're building things from the, from the start. So where we're going to end up, uh, who knows. But I think that the, the districts that have gotten in and stayed in uh, are, are really, really good districts and are looking to do thoughtful things. So since I've been instructive in sort of getting people together on this matter just to talk about it, um, I think where Arlington set is now is we're still looking to find out more information, mm -hmm. still sort of talking to things. I know um, Linda Hansen is going to be shadowing somebody and something yeah. um, just to find out mm -hmm. more information. But again, it's just, I know that Arlington has some reservations about joining certainly at this point because we feel that we've done a lot of work mm -hmm. that's very similar to it. Um, but I think the conversation continuing the conversation, continuing to learn what they're doing, um, seeing um, the progress of the districts is, is still worthwhile at this point. Yeah, I think yeah. that it's a matter of is it a good fit for us. Right. And right. because of the teacher-centric thing, the teachers through their association on their own without uh, reference the uh, superintendent or the school committee must make their own determination right. so that yeah. You know, part of this is educating the association membership and the president uh, about what it's about, what it would entail, what the benefits are, what the cost. Because the teachers came in here last right. week and said no new initiatives. Right, right. So and, says, Take but yes. in many ways, this really isn't a new initiative. It's something that we're, okay, well, uh, we're, we're doing in many ways and would probably provide more support for. So, okay, so uh, it, it's, it's all, you know, I. I I'll just leave it at that to the point that uh, we as a district and the teachers need to research it more and think about it and talk to the people in the other districts, figure out whether or not it's something that they'd want to participate right. in and gain strength and support from. Because if it's not good for the teachers, if it's not good for us, uh, we shouldn't do it. But, uh, um, you know, Nobody's made a determination either way in this. It's, it's, it's right. an information yeah. gathering, information assessing gathering period. Yeah, great. Uh, thanks. Uh, facilities, Mr. Thielen. Well, the three of us meet next on, at right. 6 o'clock on Wednesday, the 21st. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, 6 o'clock. Or, or the school enrollment task force. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we'll all be there. 6 o'clock. Yeah, we haven't had really. And in the room. Right. And we mm -hmm. haven't really had a need to caucus mm -hmm. before anything. There's been nothing really that controversial this year on that committee. Mm -hmm. So far. Well, so far. <laughs> Okay. So far, they've done exactly what we've wanted them to do. Absolutely. Well, uh, <laughs> well, as long as they continue in that vein, there'll be no well, problem. Report that's gonna no, no, no. So far, All there's right. been consensus because of the collaborative relationship with Absolutely. everybody. Absolutely. And the tremendous town support. Well, we get a report exactly. on, on the Hardy. Yes. So, policy and procedures. Uh, we met uh, Tuesday. Our, uh, we voted uh, to... Uh, bring forward to the committee uh, the idea of MASC to review, uh, work with us to review and update our entire policy book over the next three year period. Um, I'll get, I wanna get back to that and ask the board a, a question. Uh, we will be bringing for first read, hopefully, uh, at the next meeting on the vendor warrant signing. Uh, we'd worked the language, but we didn't get it in time to have a first read tonight. The language that the committee suggested, the changes. And uh, the uh, policy on uh, input on curriculum and things of that nature, we felt that the policy was adequate, but it referred to a form, and we don't have a form. So the superintendent is going to bring to the policy committee a form, and we'll bring that uh, form before. For, I'm sorry, for what? To, for if there's a concern, if a parent ha has a concern about curriculum materials oh, okay. or anything like Got it. that. So there's no place for them we to didn't, We didn't feel there was a need to change the actual policy. Yep. Uh, we discussed that over two meetings, but we, it did, uh, Dr. Ampey recognized it was, a, it said, if you have a concern, fill out the form. We didn't have a form, Got so it. we're going to work the form and bring that to you. Um, getting back to the, um, the contract, there's basically a contract between the school system and stuff. We will be required to, for a vote. Uh, how does the board want to do that? I mean, I can reach out to Mike Gilbert and ask him to come before us, uh, from MASC. Do a presentation 
start to do a vote about whether we're going to whether we we will enter the contract to oh, to review the right. Process. It's approximately ten thousand dollars paid up in over increments three over a three year period. Mm -hmm. I see. To uh, the MASC did it once before mm -hmm. uh, for this. This isn't brand new for us. I think it was done in two thousand three, two thousand five. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I, I haven't been able to find anybody that can remember that far back and doing it, but uh, it we still go through the process that we make the changes and stuff, and then the important ones we send it to council. Right. Uh, part of their thing is to have all things reviewed by council, and several of the, the things, and I'm not knocking Stoneman Chandler and Miller, but several of the policies they brought to us are MASC policies. Mm -hmm. and so I figure this may be an efficient way to do it, but I don't feel confident in answering all potential questions. Mm. The, if the board wants to send questions, I, I can send you the email to Mike Gilbert or have asked Mike Gilbert to come here mm -hmm. okay. and do a presentation. I, Dr. Alessandri. Could we, I mean, before we have him come, can we just, I mean, the recommendation of policy was to recommend to the full school committee that we enter in this contract mm -hmm. and undergo right. a three-year review mm -hmm. at the end of which we'll have a basically updated manual that adhere you know, we get rid of all the fluff mm -hmm. stuff right. and and everything mm -hmm. else is updated um do we i mean do people feel like they need more information than that I would be interested just to know, it, um, have we talked to other districts who have done this and if they felt it was worthwhile? That's sort of, that would be my sort of question. So would you, is that something you want me to find out? I can yes. do that. I, I'd, I'd love to hear mm -hmm. like, oh, X, Y, and Z's district did it. They thought it was a great use of money. You know, it's not that much money, but is it worthwhile at all? So that sort of, that's my, yeah. my concern. Did they feel it was worth the yeah. money? They all say yes. Mm -hmm. Sounds like And it's good, easy, yeah. right? And it's easy, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I just also note that one of the other things that are included in this is that MASC will then host our policy manual uh, on no. their website. Okay, and uh, that will help us? It will help us because it's a little more interactive and an easier search. Okay. Um, you, you can go on their website now and take a look at the way it, it's organized. Do you know, has Lowell done this? Do you know? Lowell has not. Has not, okay. You know, I know other districts who yeah, have yeah, done yeah. it. I can't name them, but uh, it. It, it's a, something that MAS, MASC has been doing for a while, and there are several districts who are hosted on the site, and uh, folks search. who have done it are tend to kind of been happy with the, the outcome. You can search our, our right. right, yeah. right now. Yeah. 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 The, the, the interesting, the, the upside of that is that when you do a search on this, there's multiple things mm -hmm. that come up. Mm -hmm. I saw a very complex policies on student activity fee. I saw one student activity fee policy that had two sentences in it, which I don't think DOI would be too happy with. But it was interesting to see the variance. Mm -hmm. If we're okay and I will mm -hmm. do the survey and get back. Yeah, just, I mean, I, I have one more thing to add, but I, I don't want to call, yeah. stop any conversation on this particular topic. Yeah. Okay, uh, Let, Mr. Harden. Yeah, so I, I guess I want a, a, a little bit more information about exactly what they're going to do. I don't know if they have a description of what the service yep, is. Yep, I could. Um, uh, I mean, I assume they're going to compare our policy to what they recommend as the mm -hmm. standard policy. Mm -hmm. And it, I, I can send you uh, the link to give you the whole thing okay. on it for you to yeah, read. Okay. And then if you had, great. Mm -hmm. Just share that with the committee, and then we can. I'll share it with Karen and let Karen share yeah, it Yeah, yeah, that's fine. That's good. Excellent. Yes, Dr. Allison Happy. I'm sorry. Oh, I was just going to say, if, if we do the hosting is included in the fee mm -hmm. um, for the three years, but then if we were to continue it, it's nine thousand. Oh, it's nine hundred and fifty dollars per year okay. after that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. But you don't have to continue it. You know, just 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 mm -hmm. remember that a couple of years ago we used an, our own council, and our own council yes. went through and, and knocked out some of MAS, MAS yes. policies that mm -hmm. you thought were. Yes, and they, yeah. they, they, that was one of the questions that the members asked, mm -hmm. and uh, they agreed that the, 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 those, they will, I don't remember the exact wording, mm -hmm. they will eliminate all extraneous policies, and if, if there's Who's a question, MASC, MASC yeah. and if, they, if there's a question on it, they will be happy to respond, mm -hmm. and we can deal with it like oh, so that. So one thing I would like to know is who, who do they use for legal counsel? Steve Finnegan. Oh, he knows the name. There you go. Mm -hmm. Thank you, I don't have easy. to go look that one up. There is, well, let's do, sorry, yeah. I, I don't want to stop this conversation. I have no, one no, more thing I, to add on the policy. It actually sounds like we need more, a little bit more information and then to discuss it further. I, I think we should, uh, I, I move that we invite Mike Gilbert to come present. 
Oh, wait, wait, I'm not sure we need it, him to come. It, a suggestion. Like Why don't I do sure. the do the response let's, on the let's, survey, let's, and let's then if the there's a need, first. if then there's the need, then yeah, let's see we what, can do that. If it isn't, mm -hmm. yeah, we yeah. can make a decision at that point. One last thing. Uh, there, uh, the next meeting will either be on January 11th or January 19th. I will share that as soon as I can and have it, uh, Ms. Fitzgerald, put up. The reason of the uh, issue is that we are, we are seeking the input from the uh, town comptroller on a specific uh, policy on student activity fees. We need to update ours and get it in compliance with Department of Revenue. And uh, so if he can make it on the 11th, that's when we will have it. If it isn't, as soon as Dr. Bodie lets me know, I will give it to Ms. Fitzgerald for posting for the meeting. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, so um, school enrollment task force, is there a separate? We, no, we, know this. Okay. we just said we have a uh, meeting on Warren Committee. Everybody got paid. Okay. Any liaison reports? No? Any announcements? Yes. Uh, it's not an this. announcement. It's more of a question um, about the Vision 2020 mm -hmm. education thing. So it's still, I, I understand that we're kind of help hosting it, but we're not, we're certainly not driving it. No, it's not, it's not we're not co-sponsoring these okay. things necessarily. So I it, think it, we need to be more clear somehow. Pe people, I've, I've heard other people talk and their impression is that it's kind of a school thing right. and that this is how we're seeking to get an idea of the future of education. And, and, and you know, some of it may be, it's it that may not be the view held by everyone. But I've heard some people refer to it that way, and I'm just concerned mm -hmm. that it's giving the wrong impression. And also, if it if we were to be doing something like this, we need to be doing a much bigger reach than what the Vision 2020 is doing. Right. I think it might be worth having them come speak to us actually about what because they have a, I mean, you know. They have more autonomy if they don't if they're not co-sponsoring things with us, right? If, if they're they're just doing their own thing because they have they have money, they have people that you know they have a, a, a outreach. Um, from what I understand, they do plan to be doing more outreach than they've done so far. But it might be worthwhile to have them come in and, and just sort of talk to us. Maybe it makes sense to co-sponsor some events with them and not others. You know, maybe maybe we want to get more involved. You know, I think it might make sense to do that. So yeah. maybe we can put that as a future agenda item, and I'll reach out. Okay. 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 Uh, we could start in a subcommittee. I mean, they have come to speak to community relations, but we, but it might make sense at this point to go to the whole committee. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Future, Do you have anything else? Future agenda. Uh, yeah. So any more announcements of any sort? Okay. Future agenda items. Yes. Uh, we started it, never went anywhere. The Stoneman Chandler and Miller contract. We're almost halfway through the year. I think we should. Uh, okay. We, I, I volunteered to be on a subcommittee. I don't know if it's, uh, it, uh, it ever started just to review the existing, the proposed language, and then bring it forward to either for okay. questions for the body or not. We need to vote on it at some point. Well, why can't the Policies and Procedures Committee just do it? Who's on the committee? You and Kiersey and Paul yeah, I and think I. Well, it's not really a policy or procedure. We've always had a legal committee, legal review committee. No, we have no, no, that, no. that lasted that's for. That's popped up here. Well, that's popped up. Here. But, okay. but, no, but that, 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 that's when we've been questioned. Yeah, Whenever we've questioned it, yeah. we've popped up that committee. But, uh, you know, there's been no. It's been two years since that one was active. Yeah, I know. But that's how we've dealt hey. with it. It hasn't traditionally settled. Into, into one of the committees. If we want to assign it to policies and procedures, that's that's fine. I or budget because it's a cost. Uh, you know. So do we want? Uh, so uh, well, actually, who would be interested in serving on a legal services committee? <laughs> Yourself, okay. Um, committee of two. No do you say anyone want to propose that? Aye. That sounds like a good. Okay, so proposed by Mr. Hayner, seconded by <laughs> this proposal, right, of the committee by Mr. Cardin. <laughs> okay, all in favor of creating uh, a legal services committee? So you fight by saying aye. aye. For the, I think you want to say for the purpose oh, of for the purposes reviewing. of reviewing. Mm. All, all in favor. All right. Uh, for the, for the purposes of reviewing the contract with Stoneham Chandler and, and Miller. And Miller. 
Yes. Okay. okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, so you guys should uh, figure we'll out the timing. Together. Okay, and look Thank at you. it. Thank you. Good. Okay. Um, so we have an executive session. Yes, I'm sorry, Mr. Carter. Yes, yes. Um, I, I don't know if you already have it scheduled, but we were going, talking about doing a mid-year review of progress on the superintendent's goals. Right. Um, so we do. Retreat. I mean, the retreat is when we're going to talk big picture about what, what we want that process to look like. That's not about necessarily this year. Some of it is forward looking, right? Um, we do have a mid-year uh, report, and when is that? that March. Is March. 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 But March. March. Mid-year report of, on superintendent's progress and goals in March. But um, yes, Mr. Hainer. The last time when we talked about that retreat, I yep. heard school goals. I want to make it clear. I have no problem talking about school-wide goals, but there has to be a distinction between the goals for the superintendent and school-wide. The they goals. may overlap. They may have some similarities and stuff. And I would also like on that a discussion of the timeline on this because although March is basically six months into the cycle, right. we still haven't got goals yet, so we got we, we got to move. Yeah. So we're maybe, Mr. maybe maybe it's not maybe it's not going to the process isn't going to be an appropriate retreat topic. So maybe the curriculum instruction and assessment committee should take up the process question. Fine. Okay. Because it's a pro you're talking about when are we going to hear things and. Yeah, I mean, there was certain goals that were set. But last the goal June. Right. right. So six months would actually be December. Right. I'm a little confused on the timing, but. But for example, the social emotional learning development, mm -hmm. how is that going? You know, get to so I updates think, I think, on. I think the curriculum instruction assessment committee should meet okay. and should and should figure out a timeline for reports to the school committee on the superintendent's goals. And I think that's because it's a process issue more than anything else. It shouldn't take up time in a retreat. Okay. Should we do it before the retreat so there can be some Well, I, it would be great if we could. Yeah. So we, where the Maybe retreat is December is uh, January, January, January 21, right? 21, yeah. 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 So, yeah. so we have one school committee meeting before that, uh, you know. So why don't we try to meet mm -hmm. yeah. between now and January 21, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so we can work on a Good idea. process, okay. a, a doodle date for that. Mm -hmm. Would it be helpful? I have not actually created an agenda. I, I was going to leave very loose for the treat, but I could spell out an agenda, and you could, people could suggest. Additional items or the agendas are good. Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you keep us focused. So uh, let me let me work on that, and then um, I'll throw it out. And through Karen, you can suggest additional items Great. to that. Okay. So the our committee will meet. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. Okay. Uh, we have executive session. Do we need to come out of executive session? We do not. Okay. Okay, so um, we're going to executive session to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with union and or non-union personnel or contract negotiations with union and or non-union in which if held in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect. To conduct strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation in which if held in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect. Collective bargaining may also be conducted. AFL-CIO State Council 93 Local 680 Traffic Supervisors and vote to approve the following school committee executive session minutes, Thursday, December 8th, 2016. So move. Second. Okay, moved by Mr. Hainer, seconded by Mr. Slickman. Um, roll call, Mr. Cardin. Yes. Aye. Yes. Oh. And that we are not, we are, we are. Only yeah. come out to adjourn. We are only, we are not, we, we're no, not, we don't have to, we don't come have to come out to adjourn. adjourn. We're just, go, we're just, we're, we're just not coming back. We're second, not coming back. Session. Right. Right. Okay. Dr. Alice Nampy? Yes, okay. Yes, yes, yes. 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 Okay, we are in, in executive session. Um.